years. But I'm not a politician. I've earned a couple of free trips to Hawaii, but not from frequent flyer miles. Although last year, I barely lost a race to a jet. Curtis Martin wins by one yard. Then there's my resume. I'm the only guy in NFL history to have 15 or more touchdowns in five straight years. That's 20 TDs in 11 games. Still nothing? I work with some pretty big guys, and we're making some noise in our profession. Still don't know me? Well, after tonight, you will. I've always wanted to say this. Surreal setting, under the lights, in the snow, out onto the field at Lincoln Financial Field. Come the Philadelphia Eagles as they get ready to take on the man you just met in our open, Sean Alexander and the Seattle Seahawks on Monday Night Football. Al Michaels along with John Madden, Sam Ryan, welcome to Philadelphia where it's been a very difficult season for the Eagles who've been to four straight NFC Championship games. They lost on opening night to Atlanta. Donovan McNabb got hurt. He played through the pain up until three weeks ago. And finally, his season is now over. He's had surgery. We'll see him again next year. Two other pro bowlers are also on injured reserve for Philadelphia. And you know about Terrell Owens, no longer part of the equation. Eagles 5-6 and six, trying to stay alive in the playoff hunt. It'll be very tough. Meanwhile, Seattle with a record of 9-2. and two. That's the best mark in the National Football Conference. The Seahawks have won seven straight games. And with St. Louis losing to Washington yesterday, the Seahawks have clinched a playoff spot. They have won the NFC West. They've guaranteed a January date at home. And, John, Mike Holmgren is in his seventh season. He's kind of treaded water. They've been in the playoffs, haven't won a playoff game. Now, all of a sudden, a breakout year. What's the difference? Well, you know, I think they have so much more confidence. I mean, you just look at uh, the way they act. You talk to them. You watch them play. This is a totally different team. I think maybe they have the best offensive line in football. Matt Hasselbeck throws the ball. Sean Alexander runs it, and that's a pretty potent offense. And then on defense, they're young, they're inexperienced, but they play very hard and very fast. They'll meet a Philadelphia team tonight that bears no semblance to the Philly team over the last four years. Mike McMahon is now the quarterback. What will the Eagles look like tonight and for the balance of the season? Well, you know, I know one thing. They're going to have a lot more balance between run and pass on offense. That, you know, that's Andy Reid kind of got away from the, the run with Donald McNabb and they were pass, 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 pass. Then they lose him. Now they bring in Mike McMahon and I think they're going to have more running the ball and I think that Mike McMahon is going to run the ball more. Andy Reid said that he's a slow starter. He wants to get him off to a fast start by letting him run movement passes. They're trying to stay alive in the playoff hunt. They beat Green Bay last week but tonight the Seahawks tops in the NFC at the moment in their sole Monday night appearance of the season against the Philadelphia Eagles. Now tonight's best. Very often, of course, we'll tell you weather is no factor. Tonight, weather is a factor. It's 33 degrees. It's been snowing for about two and a half hours. The conditions on the field. Let's check in with Sam Ryan. Sam? You're right, Al. It's starting to come down a lot. Pretty, pretty hard right now. They had the field covered, tarped until about 6.30. Once they removed it by 6.40, that's when it really started snowing. It's been on and off since then, getting heavier now. The wind about six miles an hour. I did speak to both quarterbacks moments, moments ago. Neither one concerned about the snow or the wind, although Matt Hasselbeck told me he's concerned about the center of the field. He said it's a little sloppy, could make it difficult for the guys in the center. Do keep in mind, Alan John, this field has heating coils underneath, so it may not stick. The snow may not stick to the field, gentlemen. John, advantage offense or defense? I think if it, if it's not windy, it's it's advantage offense. I, year, I, year, I learned that years ago from George Bland, and he told me he said that the pass rushers, you know, can't rush, and the defenders don't know what patterns you're running. So you have an advantage on the pass rush and on the pass receiving. Josh Scobie will run it back. The Seattle Seahawks will take the ball. The kick by Akers is fielded at the 12-yard line. And Scobie with a good run back out to the 36-yard line. The Seahawks, number one in the league in yards per game. Here's their offense. Matt Hasselbeck, Boston College. Sean Alexander, the University of Alabama. Max Stroll, University of Georgia. Bobby Ingram. 
Penn State. Joe Jervicious, Penn State. Jeremy Stevens, UW. Walter Jones, Florida State. Steve Hutchinson, University of Michigan. Rob Kilbeck, Wazoo. Chris Gray, Auburn. Sean Locklear, Anthony State. Very good offensive line, especially that left side where Jones and Hutchinson, the left tackle and left guard, are great. Hasselback will throw short on the first play of the game to Jeremy Stevens for a gain of three. Let's take a look at the Philly D. Curse, Florida Gators. The Tank, the Northern Illinois University. Dawn Walker, University of Tennessee. Trent Cole, University of Cincinnati. Mr. Jones, 0055, 1817, Michigan. Jeremiah Trotter, Stephen F. Austin State. Keith Adams, Clemson. Sheldon Brown, South Carolina. Michael Lewis, Colorado. Brian Dawkins, Clemson. Roger Hood, Auburn. And on a roll, the first pass to this side is to Jeremy Stevens, so he goes to the tight end again. And Michael Lewis makes the tackle. And we take a look at Hasselback, who started his career at Green Bay, was there backing up Brett Favre for a couple of years, then went over to Seattle, has made nice, steady progress to the point where this season he comes into the game tonight with a very good pass rating of 88.8, 14 touchdowns, and eight interceptions. You know, it's interesting that uh, both passes, the, the first two ones have been uh, movement passes. He sprinted to the right, and then the second pass, bootleg to the left. All times to Stevens, the tight end. To the air again, and that is caught, and Stevens has caught the first three passes of the game across the 50 to the 47-yard line. He did not have a catch last week against the Giants, and he starts with three on the first drive tonight. You know, sometimes that'll happen. You don't do something one week, and you say, you know, we're going to have to get back to that. He has good protection here, and, and you see what, what Stevens does. He just works that middle and finds the hole in the zone. And Seattle starting with a hurry-up is Sean Alexander. Has his first carry of the night. Take him across the 45 to the 43, so a good fast pace for the Seahawks on this first series of the game. You know, Sean Alexander was talking about Jeremy Stevens last night in the tight end position, and he said, you know, if the tight end catches passes in the middle, he says that opens up more holes for the running back. He said it gives you better angles to run. Hasselbeck spreads it out with Alexander on the sideline, and it's Jeremy Stevens with a fourth catch in the first two minutes and 20 seconds of the game. He had 29 coming into the game, and that will set up a third down and about four at the 41. You see Jeremy Stevens, he was kind of laughing. He said, what the heck is this all about? <laughs> Last week, I don't get anything, and now I get four in a row here. But that was an empty backfield, and uh, that's why Sean Alexander wasn't in there. They just had five receivers right on the line. Third down, make it a long two. Max Strong, the fullback, is the running back and that is strong taking it for a first down to the 36 yard line so kind of an odd beginning for Seattle a team that relies so much on Alexander he's carried only once but they're moving the ball very effectively that's an odd beginning to this play watch it, it looks like Matt Hazerbeck almost fumbled the snap then he got it out there to Max Strong and if you're going to go someplace and you're flopping in there, it's a good flop to the left side of this offensive line. Alexander back in there now, and they split the back. Strong, one of the best fullbacks in the league, great blocker. And that's Alexander going in behind it, but that time the play is broken up by Trent Cole, good-looking rookie out of Cincinnati with N.D. Palou hurt. Cole getting the play as a starter, and he's been very effective. And you know what they try and do? They want to run at Cole because he's a he's a pass rusher, undersized guy. Strong is going to come and try and block him here. He sees it, reads the block, just plays off. It's not a very good block by Strong, but Trent Cole played it very well. Second and ten, already the eighth play of this drive. And Alexander, who came up one yard shy of the rushing title last season, Curtis Martin beat him out by a yard. He comes into this game trailing only Edger and James, trailed by eight going in, but James has the advantage of having played an extra game. And Sean Alexander's going to run the ball 25 to 30 times tonight as long as you know Seattle gets in there in their balance. He said the first seven runs or so he said he's trying to set up things. He said all I do is bang it in there in the first seven. Then I see what they're doing and I go from there. Mike Holmgren has almost gone through his first 15. He strips the 15 plays. Here comes number nine. Third down and seven from the 33-yard line. 
Hasselback over the middle, and they'll convert again for a first down, and this time it is Bobby Ingram who takes it across the 20 to the 19-yard line. Good-looking Seattle opening effort. It was interesting last night when you asked Matt Hasselbeck, who's your favorite receiver? And he said, number one is Bobby Engram. He said, number two is Bobby Engram. <laughs> I think, you know, and that's the guy you go to when you get in this situation. Third down, you need a, a first down. You put him in the slot, and you go to him in that kind of pattern. And it's Sean Alexander taking it to the 13-yard line. So they've had the ball a little bit more than five minutes. Alexander has carried the ball four times for 13 yards. And this next play will be the 11th play of the drive. Timeout for an injury. 9.39 left in the first quarter. The secondary, he's going to come limping off. Quentin Michael will replace him, number 27. Yeah, it looked pretty normal. Then he goes down and, and watch. Once he goes down, he just his right hand grabs his back. And it could have been something twisting as he was going in to make that tackle because he wasn't hit or anything. They're already missing Lito Shepard, the cornerback. He's on injured reserve. Now Lewis is out. Michael is in. And Seattle with this drive, which is the opening drive of the game. And now down to the one-yard line goes Sean Alexander. He's tackled there by Brian Dawkins. It'll be first down and goal. And upcoming will be the 12th play of this drive for Mike Holmgren. See what they did is they went on a quick snap here, and they have an extra tackle. So you have three offensive linemen on this side. And again, they don't let the Eagle defense adjust to it. They get up there and go in the first sound, and Alexander just gets to the outside. Now Alexander. And Alexander, no stranger to the end zone, gets forced out of bounds at the eight-yard line by Mark Simino. Alexander has already scored 20 touchdowns this season. He's on a pace to break the record of 27 set by Priest Holmes a couple of seasons ago. You know, it was interesting. Jim Johnson, the defensive coordinator of the Eagles, was saying that, you know, that they are balanced run, you know, right and left. He said, but once they get in the red zone inside the 20, Sean Alexander runs to his left most of the time. And that's what they've done the last two plays. He said, we're going to stunt to their left, and we're going to overload their left. Second down and goal. A little fade into the corner of the end zone, and it is not caught in bounds. Joe Jerovicius, who has killed Philadelphia in recent seasons in the championship game as a Tampa Bay Buccaneer, then in the first game played in this stadium during the regular season on a Monday night, couldn't hold this one in inbounds. Yeah, and that's the other thing that Jim Johnson was worried about right there. And he just stayed in bounds. That's a touchdown, but they're worried about Joe Juravicious having that height advantage and just throwing the jump ball up there. Matt Hasselbeck threw the jump ball up there at Juravicious, but he was out of bounds. Seven runs and six passes on this opening drive. It's third down and goal from the six. Hasselbeck over the middle. A flag is thrown, and it's intercepted by Quentin Michael, who came in for Michael Lewis, but it's the first flag of the game. And let's see about the call. Andy Reid looking on. You hear the booing starting already in the crowd with Scott Green about to announce it. It's Illegal contact. It's defense. Number 27, defense. Half the distance to the goal, first half. Indeed, half the distance to the goal, first and goal. He figured it had to be on Jeremy Stevens, the tight end, because he was the guy pointing. And he was also the guy that Matt Hasselbeck was trying to throw the ball to. He's at the top of the screen there, number 86. You see him get, but I don't know. I don't know about that. And you see Stevens come in here now. Now Trotter yeah. hit him, but yeah. Michael didn't hit him. Right. It, it should have been on Trotter. Right. Receiver, 77. He's just announcing that uh, Floyd Womack is Nelsville receiver, but the call should have been against Trotter. That was the flag. First and goal, ball to the three. Alexander to the outside. He can't get out of the backfield as Brian Dawkins stopping him. So the Philadelphia offense has still not been on the field. We're seven minutes into the game. They've run 14 plays, but keep in mind, Seattle is number one in yards per game in the league. The Eagles defense, 24th. But you know, you, you have a guy like Brian Dawkins up there at the line of scrimmage. He makes a lot of plays. He can he can be back and play as a safety, but he can get up on the line of scrimmage and play as well or better than a linebacker. And he just did on that last play. 
Second and goal. They have Jared Vicious split to the left. They're going to give the ball to Alexander. He's going to spin around. And I don't know where he was going to go, but he goes nowhere because the Eagles break through. And Clinton Michael is in the backfield. So they're back at the 12-yard line now. Yeah, we talk about Jim Johnson, and that's what he loves to do. We know that he loves to blitz. We know that he loves to bring defensive backs. He loves to bring pressure. But he really loves it when once you get inside the red zone. Once you're inside the 20, you know that you're going to get it, whether you're running or passing. And the Seahawks got it on that play. Eight-minute drive. 16th play of the drive. Third and goal. Good protection. But the secondary does its work. Hasselback rolling to the sideline. Throws. Touchdown. He waited and waited. And finally, Bobby Ingram got free for the score. Well, that's what he was talking about. Who's your favorite receiver? Number one, number two is Bobby Ingram. That time, the, the Eagles had no pass rush whatsoever. And look at all the time that, that Matt Hasselbeck has back there. I mean, he's going to come back, and he's going he's to look to his left. He's going to look to the middle. He's going to wait, and he's going to wait. Then he's going to run out to the right. Here's Bobby Ingram right here, and that's the place to, to go. When, when, when your quarterback starts to scramble, always get to the end line. Josh Brown for the point after. Stunningly, Ingram has caught 50 passes this season. He's their leading receiver. That's his first touchdown. What a drive. 16 plays, 7-0 Seattle. It's an amazing drive. Think about it. That's 3.9 yards per play, but they pick up six. And watch the time that Matt Hasselbeck has. First the part of it is pass protection. Very good pass protection. The second part of it is Hasselbeck running with the ball and buying time. And the third part is Bobby Engram going to the back line. So Philadelphia will finally get the ball. Brown will kick off. That's Dexter win at the 10 yard line. Out to the 30. Mike McMahon of the offense will finally get to go to work with 645 remaining in the opening quarter on Monday Night Football. Seahawks out front, 7 0. Oh, yeah. And that's what you bring to Philadelphia on a 33 degree night. Yummy. Everything's hot. That offense was hot. Now we'll see about Philadelphia. Mike McMahon taking over for Donovan McNabb on injured reserve. Drafted by Detroit in 2001, and they begin with a McMahon roll to his right. Throws on the run, which is what he loves to do. Intended for L.J. Smith. Incomplete. Here's the Philly offense. Michael McMahon, Rutgers University. Brian Westbrook, Villanova University. Josh Perry, San Jose State. Greg Lewis, University of Illinois. Reggie Brown, Georgia. L.J. Smith, Rutgers University. Todd Herman, Saginaw Valley State. Adrian Clark, the Ohio State University. Jamal Jackson, Delaware State. Sean Andrews, the big kid, Arkansas. John Runyon, Michigan. Runyon making his 140th straight start. Flag. At the snap. Left side of that offensive line. John, of course, I talked about a couple of pro bowlers gone. Trey Thomas gone for the season on injured reserve, so they go to the rookie there and Todd Harriman's as we get the call from Scott Green. Offside. Defense. Number 98. Five yard penalty. Second down. Yeah, and I watched him play on, on, on film. Todd Harriman's, Adrian Clark is playing the, the left guard, so that's a new starter there. Jamal Jackson, the center, starting there for Hank Fraley. That whole side, and you think, oh, geez, they'll be weak. You know, they lose all these offensive linemen. These three guys play very well. These guys are not stiffs. Second and five after Grant Wistrom is whistled for the offside. And they give it to Westbrook straight ahead. He had his first 100-yard game of the season last week against Green Bay. Here's the Seattle D. Joe Tafoya, Arizona. Charter Darby, South Carolina State. Rocky Bernard, Texas a and Grant Wistrom, University of Nebraska. D.D. Lewis, Texas Longhorns. Love the Tupu, King Phillip Regional High School. Leroy Hill, Clemson. Andre Dyson, Utah. Michael Bowen, Florida State. Mark May, Florida. Marcus Trufant, Washington State. So Joseph Foy introduced himself. He's Bryce Fisher, has an injured foot, has it in a boot, but he's 
in the game right now. They're going to use Fisher in third down situations tonight. And McMahon on third and short. This is something he does very effectively. Runs with the football, picks up the first down. Yeah, and that was one of the things that Andy Reid was talking about the other day. He said we, we have to start him running because he starts so slowly. You know, he's a high-energy guy, and he's always kind of hyped up, and you have to calm him down. He said he'll be a little better in the second quarter and then a little better in the third quarter when things start to slow down for him. And instead of throwing short, quick passes, he wants to run them, use movement passes, and maybe even throw deep early. First down now, McMahon with that straight drop. Flings it off to the side. He loves to go to Westbrook. Westbrook, again, among the league leaders in receptions and receiving yards for running backs. Mike McMahon, take a look at his first half numbers this season, starting very slowly, a 31 rating. And then he warms up a lot in the second half. They need him to get started a lot quicker tonight. Well, I think that's why he wanted those movement type passes. And again, you know, years ago I learned that, you know, when a guy is a hyper guy, a quarterback, and he's one of those guys that gets all fired up, the thing that he loses first is, is the touch. So if you want to, if you want to get him off to a good start, don't have him throw those short, quick touch passes. Let him run and throw it, or let him just air it out, throw it deep. Westbrook shaken up on the play so that would be a huge loss as he is their main man not only out of the backfield running it catching it as well Ryan Motes a rookie from Louisiana Tech third round draft choice will come in he saw some action last week here's how Westbrook got shaken look like he hurt his right foot right there as he goes out of bounds I saw him you see how he kind of lifted that right foot out of the ground. Jimmy Williams is in on the tackle, and now you've got Moats, and you have another flag. Moats carrying the ball last week for the first time in the game against Green Bay. You know, it's funny how he carried the ball the first time last week, and offside defense number 69 lining up in the neutral zone, five-yard penalty, first down. But Andy Reid says that he's his best pure runner. Talking about Ryan Moats. I mean, I I kind of like Westbrook. I think I think <laughs> Westbrook is probably the best pure anything that this Eagle team has. But he said just as a runner, he thinks Ryan Moats is the best. Still working on Westbrook on first and five now. Pressure is put on the blitz, and down will go McMahon because it was Michael Bowler, the brother of Peter of the Baltimore Ravens, who came flying in and created McMahon having to move up in the pocket, and getting the sack. Michael Bulware was a was a linebacker in college and then, and then with the Seahawks they made him him a safety so when he comes down here and blitzes or plays close to the line of scrimmage that's what he's used to. I mean he just came on I and mean, he didn't do a heck of a lot other than that's the first thing Mike McMahon saw. On second and five now most to the outside and most will step out of bounds just about at that marker. At the 39 yard line. Back to that play with Westbrook as he gets hit by Williams. See, that's his right foot right there. And see, see how he kind of lifts it up and gets it out of the ground. Well, he's been the workhorse again this year. Carell Buckholter is a guy they, they keep trying to get into the lineup and he keeps getting hurt early in the season. That was the case again in training camp this year so Westbrook has been the man throughout the season but right now we'll have to wait and see first and ten and that is intercepted inside the 30 by Andre Dyson and Andre Dyson is out in front and nobody's going to catch him and there are no flags on the field as Dyson intercepts McMahon with three and a half minutes to go in the opening period to make it 13 to nothing. I don't think that Andy Reid wanted Mike McMahon to start out throwing the ball drop back this soon. I think he wanted to have a move here. It's just a drop back. You see Dyson reads it all the way undercuts it gets a jump on it there and, 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 and he's off to the races. Greg Lewis doesn't do a good job. I mean you have to be out there and you have to fight that defender for the ball. And when he he comes in you have to be coming back and, and not let him undercut not let him do that to you. 
Josh Reed to the point after. Andre Dyson ran back. Three interceptions for touchdowns as a tight. Now his first as a Seahawk. 14 to nothing. 319 to go in the opening. Curry of hot start on a cold night. But the best team right now in the NFC, the 9 and 2 Seahawks. A special night here earlier tonight at about 545. A ceremony. Reggie White's 92 retired. His daughter Jacolia. Widow Sarah. There was Buddy Ryan. A lot of the guys are here. They'll have a halftime ceremony. Honoring Reggie White. He's spent so many great seasons with the Eagles before going to Mike Hunter in Green Bay. And you've got a flag here. You know, it was very cool, John, before the game, a couple of minutes before we came on the air. Jacolia, his Reggie's daughter sang that national anthem. She got a she got a great ovation, and then the crowd will begin to chant. Here's the end of uh, the rendition tonight. And then the crowd went right into a chant of Reggie, Reggie, Reggie for about 30 seconds. Yeah, Very that cool. Was, that was something special because it just, you know, brought back memories that that's what they used to do when Reggie played here. You know, it was Reggie, Reggie, Reggie. And as, as soon as she finished singing the song, they broke into it. I thought, oh God, this brings back a lot of great memories. Now you see Randall playing in here tonight. One of his former teammates is Ryan Motes. Picks up a yard or so. Jordan Babadol makes the tackle. I want to keep an eye again on Brian Westbrook, who got shaken up on that first series. You know, one of the things with Ryan Motes and being a, a, a pure runner, anytime a running back comes into the National Football League, he always has the running skills because that's the same stuff he did in high school and college. I mean, running is running, but the big thing is the passing game. You're running pass patterns and also pass protection. So when you get in, Second and long and third and long, you usually have to get those guys out of there. Second and 19. That man throwing, and that's caught up at the 41 yard line. Look at a bunch of that 19 as Reggie Brown, the rookie out of Georgia, getting to play more and more, of course, once Terrell Owens got suspended. And Owens is now off suspension, but inactive for the rest of the season. And Brown getting his opportunity. Yeah, here's Reggie Brown up on top, and you're going to see him push off there because they want to press him and then come back and run a hook pattern. And I tell you, you know, we talked about Mike McMahon and being able to run and throw in the move. He also has a gun as an arm. I mean, he can he can whip that thing in there. Third down and five. So Westbrook came back into the game. And McMahon down the left sideline and the pass is incomplete. Darnarian McCants. The intended receiver and into the game comes the ageless one, Mr. Sean Landetta, who was re-signed this week by Philadelphia. He's been here before. He's been everywhere before. I mean, take a look at, at his career. A man who made his first kick on Monday Night Football in 1985 in the Giants-Redskins game, forever remembered as the night Lawrence Taylor broke Joe Theismann's leg. It's been that long. And this is a short kick fielded by Jimmy Williams who brings it back to the 22 yard line with a minute and 24 seconds remaining in the first period. Sean Landetta not happy with that move. Well you saw uh, Sean Alexander if you were with us at the top he did our open tonight. Who am I? Well you're going to know after tonight. Well over the first six seasons Emmett Smith had a hundred touchdowns and Alexander at this point with five games still to play counting tonight's game has 92 touchdowns and as we said before with 20 already he's on a pace to score 29 which would break Priest Holmes's record. Yeah, and he's kind of a slow starter too and you're going to see Sean Alexander is going to run a lot more effectively in the third and fourth quarter than he does the first and second. Talked to him last night about that he said after about number 20 is when I really get going. This is his ninth carry already. What he really got going after eight tonight as he gets dragged down from behind by Brian Dawkins. You've got Michael Lewis who has shaken him also back in the game now. An 18-yard run for Alexander. Yeah, we're talking about this offensive line, and you talk so much about the left side of it. You think that the right side isn't very good. 
but the right side is also very good and very effective run blockers. And, and, the, and the great thing about Sean Alexander is he has patience and vision. All I can see right now are dark green jerseys. <laughs> There's a lot of dark green jerseys on them right now, isn't there? <laughs> Wet green jerseys. <laughs> is that dark green, or are the Eagles wearing black jerseys It's, it's almost black. It's that, it's that darker, very dark shade of green, which is even, it's even darker now with the, uh, with the moisture. Now you never know anymore. Remember, you yeah. used to be able to look at an NFL jersey and know who the team is and what their colors were. You have no idea anymore. Merchandising one wild. Pass is dropped by Jeremy Stevens. Now, Jeremy Stevens has to be one of the tallest tight ends in the NFL, if not the tallest. He's six foot seven, and you know we always talk about the tight end being a target in the middle and you know going in the middle of the field against zones and. When you're six foot seven and 260 pounds, you're a pretty good target for the quarterback. And I can see why Matt Hasselbeck likes that. Stayed in town, went to school at the University of Washington, located in Seattle. Third down and six from the 45. 18 ticks remaining. Looks like Peyton Manning. Yeah. It's the only time they've let the play clock go all the way down today. Great protection. And the pass is incomplete. Again, he was looking Stevens's way. Can't connect, and it's fourth down, and they'll punch. Yeah, you know, again, we talk about this offensive line and how they run block for Sean Alexander, and they pass protect pretty doggone well for Matt Hasselbeck. Watch this. I mean, this is pass protection. They just pack the whole bunch in there, and he just stands there and stands there and stands there. I mean, if, if the Eagles are going to do anything on defense, if they're going to make anything happen, they're going to have to start getting pressure on Matt Hasselbeck. By the time they rushed only three, they dropped Kalu back into coverage. Tom Ruin, longtime Denver punter, signed earlier this season by Seattle. Line drive to the 17 yard line. This is Reno Mahe with a flag down, two flags in fact, at the 20 yard line, and the clock stops at two ticks. Referee tonight, Scott Green, first full year as a ref. He was on Johnny Greer's crew last year. Johnny couldn't finish the season. Middle block in the back. Number 23, return team. 10-yard penalty, first down. Green ascended to the role of referee, and it's his first Monday night referee job. Brian Moats the penalty. Andy Reid, well, it's five times now. He has trailed by 10 or more points in the first quarter. The only time he was able to to win one of those games was at Kansas City back in uh, early October. Yeah, I wonder if that's not part of that losing Super Bowl hangover syndrome. I'm not sure what happens to those teams after they lose the Super Bowl, but the next year they sure aren't very good. It's amazing, and we're gonna, we'll detail it shortly, but here goes McMahon rolling to the outside. Of course, that abounds at the 14, and that'll be the end of the first quarter here in Philadelphia. End of one, the Seattle Seahawks. Best record in the NFC, 14, and the Philadelphia Eagles, nothing. Monday Night Football back after this message into words from our ABC stations. Back in Philadelphia, Al Michaels, John Madden, Sam Ryan, Monday Night Football, hot start for the Seattle Seahawks on top, 14 to nothing. That opening drive, assuming more than half the period, snowing, 32 degrees, but a full house per usual in South Philly, 68,000 Lincoln Financial Field. Second down and three, Eagles from the 15-yard line. Westbrook going nowhere. John was talking about that Super Bowl hangover, and boy, it's, it's, it's all truth and no fiction. The Giants in 2001, under 500. The Rams, after they lost to New England, dropped to 7 and 9. The Raiders dropped to 4 and 12 after they went. Carolina to 7 and 9, and now you've got Philadelphia John at 5 and 6. Right, I don't know that the Raiders have, have recovered either, and you, know, you wonder you wonder what it is because you know I mean you want to say well it's the length of the season and you know, shorter off season and all those things but the Super Bowl winner doesn't seem to have those same hang on. Not, certainly not to that extent and right now yet yeah, it's Lofa to Tupu 
if the last name sounds familiar and the bluebirds are out what else is new Mosi is his father Mosi Tatupu longtime Patriot played with the Rams a little bit as well he went to USC did Lofa starting rookie middle linebacker and he's done a great job this season yeah, and the coaches love him because he's on the field all the time he makes all their calls all their line adjustments all their stunts he's the quarterback of that defense. Now the 43 year old Landetta lines up his first punt was 38 yards. Sean into the snow filled air has a fair caught by Jimmy Williams at the 46 yard line. Two coaches who go all the way back with Mike Holmgren hiring Andy Reid in, in Green Bay helping to lead to Andy getting the job here and they, they go all the way back to Brigham Young when Reed was a graduate assistant and Holmgren was on the staff for Lavelle Edwards and he was in charge of the graduate assistants. Yeah, and he said he he knew right then that Andy Reed was going to be a special coach. He said because he was smart and uh, you know he he had he had good management skills. He was organized and he threw another thing in there that I'm not sure you need. He said he was funny. He, that he is. And the pass is incomplete, intended for. Bobby Ingram Brian Dawkins breaks it up when Holmgren was at Green Bay take a look at some of the guys in this picture and, and, and what's happened here I mean you've got Andy Reid of course is now here in his seventh season John Gruden went to Oakland now to Tampa has won a Super Bowl Steve Mariucci was recently fired in Detroit Dick Durant took over for Mariucci there and he was in Chicago and then Ray Rhodes was the coach here for four years with Reid taking over after Rhodes got fired in the 98 season second and ten Alexander across the 50 to the 49 yard line let's check in with Sam Ryan and you know Al the perfect guy to talk about the similarities between Andy and Mike Eagles assistant head coach Marty Morningweg who worked with both men as an assistant in Green Bay Marty told me Mike was his quarterbacks coach in high school taught him how to play the game Andy helped teach him about coaching he said the structure is very similar they start they finish meetings pretty much the same way the organization he said they're the same guy there the difference is the emotion Andy is calmer on the sideline Mike wears his emotion on his sleeve. A little bit more than Andy does. <laughs> it's funny that that split screen we had them a minute ago as Hasselback rolls and is under pressure and gets it away, but it's incomplete, intended for Bobby Ingram along the sideline. They, they almost looked like they had morphed into each other. <laughs> but the, the way they're bundled up and the glasses and the and the way they call the plays with the card in front of the microphone. Right, and when they when they talk, they they, they talk the same. They have the same expressions and. You could darn near close your eyes and not be exactly sure which one you were talking to. <laughs> but it's interesting, their play cards, Andy Reid's has a lot more plays on it than Mike Holman's. Tom Ruin, his punt, they can't signal it, but letting it go is Mahe. And Seattle will cover it up and pin Philadelphia pretty deep with 12.34 to go in the opening half. Crowd already unhappy. Seattle 14, Philadelphia nothing. Under the lights, in the snow. He's going to wait, and he's going to wait. Here's Bobby Ingram right here. And that is intercepted, and nobody's going to catch him. And that man who intercepted and ran it back 70 yards is out of the game right now. That's Andre Dyson. They're telling us a shortness of breath, so he's on the bench. Kelly Herndon is already hurt. They're minus him. Jordan Babineau comes in to take Dyson's spot at one of the corners, and it's first and ten for McMahon and company from the seven yard line. Line does its job. McMahon does his job, and it's Rutgers to Rutgers as L.J. Smith makes the catch and is tackled up at the 32 yard line by Mark Emanuel. Yeah, you know, we were talking about the uh, protection of the Seattle Seahawks. This is pretty good protection here by the Philadelphia Eagles. Last time they had the ball down there, Andy Reid went three straight runs. This time he comes out in a pass, and if you have protection like that, and a guy can get open like L.J. Smith, you can throw the ball all night on this defense. Well, that's secondary right now. Herndon hurts. Dyson on the bench, and of course Ken Hamlin 
suffered a fractured skull in a fight in downtown Seattle outside of a bar about a month and a half ago, so he's gone for the season. First and 10 from the 34-yard line. McMahon going deep, and it is knocked away at the last moment. Trufant got his right arm in front of Greg Lewis. Crowd wants a flag. They don't get one. I don't know if they should want a flag or Greg Lewis just fighting for the ball a little more. You know that. You know, I, mean, I hate to go back to Terrell Owens, but that's really. I mean, those are the types of things that he would do. I mean, that ball is in the air. You have to go get it. I mean, I think that Greg Lewis has as as much chance. I mean, you, you got to fight. You got to you got to get your right shoulder in there, push off a little, use your body to get in a little better position to make that catch to help your quarterback out. Didn't do it. It's second down and ten now. They started the game three out of seven for 51 yards. Short drop, intercepted again, and going all the way to the end zone will be the rookie Lofa Tukupu. And Mr. Mosi Tukupu is smiling in front of his television set right now as his young pup has just run it back 38 yards for a touchdown. The first of his career. Yeah, you're going to see Tatupo. He's just reading the eyes. He's just going to go back and just just read the eyes of the quarterback. He's playing zone. The minute he sees Mike McMahon look to his left, Tatupo gets a jump on it, undercuts it, intercepts it. Good read in a zone defense by the middle linebacker. Josh Brown to bang it through. So the Seattle Seahawks perennially having difficulty in the Eastern time zone. But at the moment, they are the kings of the East. 21 to nothing. Next weekend on the Disney Company, Monday Night Football, Saints Falcons from Atlanta, Mike Vick and Company. Brett Favre in action on Sunday night on ESPN Lions Packers from Green Bay. 21 to nothing. Seahawks on top trying to go to 10 and 2. Trying to win their eighth straight game. Dexter Wynn feels the kick. From the 12, he brings it back out to the 28-yard line. Here's Sam Ryan. Al, you're talking about Lofa Tatupu and his dad, Moisey. His dad's name actually didn't pave the road to the NFL for him. In fact, Lofa told me he wasn't even recruited coming out of high school. He went to Maine because he didn't have any other choice. So after a year there, he sent film and a letter to Pete Carroll at USC, his dad's alma mater. He transferred there. He told me he felt like, quote, a charity case at USC because he was in his dad's shadow. He did make a name for himself earning first-team All-American honors last year, went second round in the draft last year. Now he's the leading tackler for the Seahawks, and Mike Holmgren said he should be in contention for Rookie of the Year. He didn't hurt himself with that last interception in return. Meanwhile, as McMahon came out, it's Philadelphia, so the crowd was at least half the crowd booing, and they're to the point when they're ready to see Coy Detmer come into the game. Yeah, but if Coy Detmer is thinking, you know, you know, he's the guy that can manage a game, and you know, if your defense is playing well and your running game is going, you can get play action pass, and Coy Detmer can do some of the, some of those kinds of things. I don't know that he would say, okay, give me the game now. We're down 21 nothing. Let me have it. Put in Jaws as in Ron Jaworski. Put him and Randall Cunningham's in the stadium tonight. That's second. what they need is one of those flingers. Absolutely. Second down and eight. McMahon rolling to his right. Under pressure. Steps out of bounds. It'll be third down upcoming. Run out by Trick Darby. Yeah, you, know, you talk about Chartrick Darby, and he's one of those guys that has a good motor, too. And, and I don't know if this Seattle defense is, is really good enough to be a championship defense, but I know that they have a lot of guys with good motors. Grant Whisperm is that kind of guy. Bryce Fisher is that guy. Chuck Darby is that guy. We talked about Tutufo. You know, you know I mean, he's that kind of guy. And, and, you know, once you get guys playing like that, playing fast, playing hard, Good things can happen even though you are an experienced below. Third down and four. McMahon checks down. Completes it for a first down up to the 44. To Brian Westbrook on the subject of the Seattle defense as you look at uh, 
McMahon picking up the first down. Ray Rhodes is their defensive coordinator, but Ray suffered what they called a mild stroke at the beginning of the season. So Ray's been in the office, but he has not, he doesn't travel. So Ray is back home. John Marshall was their linebackers coach. They've now made John the defensive coordinator in Ray's absence. And he takes care of this the Seattle defense in the absence of Rhodes, the ex-Philadelphia coach. And the best to Ray. We hope his recovery goes very well as Westbrook picks up a couple right here. Right, and you say Ray is there for the for the meetings and the preparation, but not only is he not at the games, but they also don't let him go in the practice field. Right, and that's Mike Mike Holmgren. That's that's his choice, and you know you don't fool around these days. Is the coaches are stressed out anyway. I don't have to tell you and. And, 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 <laughs> well, you're you're the only coach who's not who's not. You figured it out a long time ago. You got off the, the field. You got off airplanes. It's perfect. Second down and eight. McMahon going deep over the middle, and that's incomplete. But it is a it is a tough business now, and I will say that that it's it's a lot tougher for these guys than it was when I coached with us. You know, salary cap and, and these high salaries and, and free agency and all these things that these coaches have to deal with. It's, it's very, very difficult. And, and, then, I, and then you're held up to the cable every day on talk radio, in the newspapers. I mean, yeah. just, it's, it's, it's incessant. And then Mike Holmgren says something about officiating last week, and then they fine him, and then they tell him he can't talk to the officials in New York for, for two more weeks. Plus than 10,000. And McMahon will go down and get sacked here by Leroy Hill. We talked about the rookie to Tupo. Leroy Hill is a rookie from Clemson. Jamie Sharper heard, so he gets a chance to start here and gets the sack. Leroy Hill, you're going to see him right, right up the middle. He's just coming. He's, he's right there in that A-gap, standing right there, and the ball snaps, and he just blows through the hole. Mandetta. Caught at the 25-yard line, and Jimmy Williams will run it back to the 32-yard line. Flag down. So if Mike Holmgren has a complaint about this game, he cannot call the league office and, and talk about it. Now, they're, they're going to review this game, Outside. the officials will, but they're not going to let him talk about Number it. Number 35. Five-yard penalty. I'm not sure I know that, that that means anything because they're not going to change anything. The coaches, a lot of coaches, a lot of administrators will talk to the league office during the weeks, send them the tape or whatever, discuss certain plays. And it's pretty well known that, you know, from time to time, the, the one thing about the league, and Mike Pereira in particular, he's a very honest guy, the officials blow something. He'll normally tell the coach because it's it's pretty evident. I mean, everybody's seen it on television. This green goes over with Holmgren here. Mike said, you know, I should I should have been more Penalty circumspect than what I said. First down. That always happens in this league. You know, after the game on Monday and Tuesday, complain, and then they have to apologize on Wednesday and Thursday. And that's after they won the game. <laughs> Mike Holmgren's team on top 21 to nothing over Andy Reid's Philadelphia Eagles. 8.29 to play in the opening half. Great start for Seattle. Their offense on the field right now. 33 yard line. Hasselbeck hands the ball. Alexander bounces it outside, but from no game and another penalty. The Eagles are going to get back into this game. I think they're going to have to come up with a play on defense. So, you know, a big play, a turnover, uh, maybe an interception, take it back in the end zone, something like that to get this thing stopped Race and pass. turned around. Defense, five yard penalty, first down. Look at the play call cards of both of these head coaches. It started with Mike Holmgren's. Now, there's Mike's, and his is not color coded. It's not a lot of plays on it either. It's smaller and simpler. <laughs> and that's how it started. And look what Andy Reid made out of it. He made a bigger card. He got plays all over the place, and he got color codes for everything you could want to call. And, and he put a lot of plays in the margin and underneath as well. So it's almost like, you know, he has it boxed out, but then he, he runs, there it is. He, he runs out of room. So he's got stuff off on the right. He's got stuff on the bottom. 
he's going to need every one of those calls tonight to get back in the game. Yeah, and that and that thing is about twice the size of Mike Holmgren's, and it doesn't even have any T.O. plays on it anymore. Remember, remember the first time that we looked on it, he had he had plays for three players, and one was T.O. and and that was the biggest section. Then he had one for Brian Westbrook, and he had one for L.J. Smith. He had three categories of plays for special players. Second and four. Alexander to the 45. Mike Holmgren won't need as many plays tonight with a three touchdown lead and a running back like Alexander. Of course, you're not thinking about chewing up the clock in the first half, but they are perfectly positioned with a big lead in the second half to use a lot of clock with this guy. You know, Mike Holmgren was saying last night, he said, I really want to attempt to run tonight. You know, and, and, and he's one of those coaches, and Andy Reid is the same way that. Once they get off on a passing tangent, they have a tough time getting back to the run sometimes. But he said he really wants to stay with it tonight. Alexander already his 15th carry. Hit by Jeremiah Trotter, the middle linebacker. Talking about Seattle, the problems they have when they fly east. And of course, it's a long trip, obviously, coming from Seattle, any place in the eastern time zone. And through the years, it's been very, very difficult. In fact, Seattle, when you take a look at them this year, the only two losses against Jacksonville and Washington. And there it is from 2003 till now, one and seven in the East. And in the other time zones, 27 and eight. Go West, young man, said Horace Greeley, and stay there. Well, you know what it is. They play all those losses were one o'clock games, and it's tough to play a one o'clock game on the East Coast. Alexander, yeah, that's the addendum to what we just showed you. One and seven in the East. The seven losses at one. The one win a couple of years ago at Tampa Bay at four o'clock. And now tonight, you see, the, the key is to, to either go at four o'clock or nine o'clock. Yeah, because then it's more normal. Because if you you think, you know, at one o'clock, it's 10 o'clock back there. And I remember this when we used to travel that way. But it's, it's not only the game. It's your whole thing. I mean, if you get up, you know, five hours before the game, you know, it's like five o'clock in the morning. You know, and your pregame meal is at six o'clock in the morning, and things that are very unnatural to you, you have to do when you play one o'clock games in the East Coast. And Eggs Bennett, it don't make for a very good pregame meal. On third down and eight, the pass is thrown behind Joe Jerovicious in his fourth down with five and a half minutes to go in the half. You would be surprised what guys have for pregame meals any time of the day. Would it, have you ever seen anybody have eggs Benedict for a pregame meal? You know, I used to have a rule they could have anything they wanted, and then so they would just put in their order. Yeah, I mean, I had eggs Benedict. I had guys that had ice cream sundaes. I had, <laughs> you know, waffles, hamburgers, steaks. I mean, just it was it's as wide a variety as you could possibly think of. Tom Ruin to punt. Now, of course, every team has a nutritionist. Bruno Mahi. Drive down to the 26-yard line. Well, not literally nutritionist, but you know, I mean, every, everything is is so overdone now, and people come in, and here's what you should have, and the fat grams are this, and the calories are that. Right. I think they do all have nutritionists now. But the Eagles have have a, a thing. Here's here's Coy Detmer right now. You wanted him, you got him. Holding. 23 return team. After the distance to the goal, first down. Ryan Motes. So Coy Detmer will come in. He's in his ninth year from Colorado. We'll see him when the Eagles have the ball as we come back in a moment. Only one adjective to describe that. Ugly. Two interceptions, both return for touchdowns. Three punts. McMahon's on the bench. Detmer's in the game. And Coy Decker, the backup to McNabb since Donovan got here, will hand the ball off as he picked up some breathing space here, breathing room. Westbrook picks up about six. We saw Detmer come into a game when McNabb got hurt in 2002 on a Monday night in San Francisco and turned in a phenomenal performance. And then before that night was over, John, as we recall, a dislocated elbow, and A.J. Feely finished out that season. Right, he threw those two touchdowns, dislocated the elbow, but uh, I remember he was on the horse trailer that game. I mean, that was one of the best games that I've ever seen Troy Detmer play. Detmer's pass, and that 
that's deflected and that's intercepted by Michael Bolware. He's inside the 10 and he comes that close to a third run back for a touchdown. So a deflected pass and it's now first and goal on the pick by the safety. And we talk about Tatupo and the things that, that he's done. We saw him intercept a pass. We've seen him make tackles. And watch, he's going to be the guy that makes a deflection here. He starts back here. He's reading the tight end. He just gets he just gets underneath L.J. Smith as he turns the ball, hits him right in the shoulder, bounces up, and then goes to Bulware for the interception. Lofa Tutupu has been something special here in this first half. I mean, not only you know his reads on the run, you kind of expect that again from a college middle linebacker, but he's had excellent pass reads. Can Alexander get his 21st touchdown of the season? And 21 touchdowns all on the ground for Sean Alexander. Priest Holmes with the NFL record of 27. And this place is in shock right now. And Jim Johnson was right. You know, they're balanced right and left. But when they get down here and they really need it, and he's going to score touchdowns, most of the time it'll be running to his left. Josh Brown tacks on his fourth extra point of the night with four minutes and 34 seconds to go in the opening half. The Seahawks in their only Monday night appearance of the season and making the most of it. So how are the digital cameras coming? They're um, cuckoo. Look, it's a cuckoo. You know, I whittled a tripod earlier. I whittled two tripods. You know, sir, this year we can use the easy button to get all the digital cameras we need. Mega pixels. Do it. This holiday, get all your digital gifts with the easy button. Staples has a huge selection of brand name digital cameras. And this week, get a free Epson all in one printer when you buy any Sony camera after easy rebate. Staples, that was easy. Lofa Tatupu with the interception for a run back, deflection that led to another interception. His dad, mostly, of course, remembered mostly with New England. He was a fullback. At a time when the fullback carried a lot more than the fullback carries. Now, at one point, he held the record for most games by a running back in the NFL. Subsequently, exceeded by Marcus Allen, 199. And his son is off to a pretty terrific start in his young career. Mostly, Tutupo was, was a good runner, but a very good blocker. He was a, he was a real tough running back. You can see how a running back like Mosey could have a son that plays linebacker like that. Brown's kick taken to the 10 yard line by Dexter Wynn. Dexter Wynn will bring it back up to the 34 yard line. Reggie White will be honored at halftime. Eagles here, 85 to. 92 eight phenomenal seasons wound up with 198 sacks in his career and he still had a heck of a lot left when he left here and then as a free agent he goes to Green Bay and, and that along with Mike Holmgren going there and Brett Favre coming of age and and that's when the Green Bay Packers became good again. Seven-yard gain for Westbrook. John, I think about that as maybe being the most important free agent signing since they went to that this form of free agency years ago. Yeah, I think you know that's when you could tell that free agency was in and the game is going to change. And I was thought of Reggie White as a Philadelphia Eagle, Joe Montana as a San Francisco 49er. When Reggie White became a Green Bay Packer, Joe Montana became a Kansas City Chief. I said this football is going in a different direction. And that's knocked away. And I think the thing with Green Bay, too, in, in those years when nobody really knew how free agency would play out, everybody thought nobody's going to want to go to Green Bay. That's that's a place coaches threaten to to wave you to. And then when Reggie White decides he'll go to Green Bay and it'll be cool to play up there, and he proved that it was, I think he, he brought a lot of other people 
in his wake right to he, Wisconsin. Did, he did more for players wanting to go to Green Bay than anyone else including management coaches whatever as you say if it was good enough for Reggie it's good enough for me third down and three swings it out to the flat Westbrook stays in bounds close to a first down to Tupu makes the tackle there I'm going to mark it right to where that uh, yellow line that's one thing about Tutupo. He's a he's a sideline to sideline guy, isn't he? I mean, if you run, he's going to be there. If you pass, he's going to be there. He has he has great instincts and great reading, and then he has the speed to go with it. You see him read, 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 and then just go go right down the line, and then be able to finish it and make the tackle at the end. He's pretty good. Mm. Well, they talked about him in preseason. They're going to be short of a first down here. Mike Holmgren telling us we did a preseason game. I think he was he was hurt that night, but Mike was saying, and the crowd wants the Eagles to go for it. That's why you have booing here. Right, and they started to to put the kick kick team out, and they called them back. So the fans started to boo. The kick team was running out. Fans started to boo. They just stopped and came back, and the and the offense stayed in there. But you know, I mean, they're right. 28 to nothing. What the heck? You got to yeah. go for it. They haven't had good field position all night. They finally get a little of it. And when you get a little of it, you have to keep it. Three and a half to go in the half. Fourth down. Westbrook is offset in the backfield. And it's a sneak. And Detmer, well, Seattle says he doesn't have it, but it appears he does. You know Reggie White had a had a move Al that uh, no one else had at the time it was called a hump move and you know Howie Long kind of took it and started to do it but watch what he do he just take his inside arm and just knock that tackle right out of the screen and you say who's that tackle that tackle was a pretty good one it was Larry Allen. Yeah that's that's an amazing shot I mean Larry Allen's going to wind up in the Hall of Fame probably. Larry Allen bench presses 700 pounds. You talk about strength. Number 44. Definitely throws that one behind Westbrook. Well, the the fans in in this stadium and the old stadium, Veterans Stadium, have not experienced a game like this in a long time. And uh, you know you hope they don't experience a lot more. This this is this is ugly. And. Uh, I mean, they just can't get anything going offensively, and then they have turnovers, and they really can't stop Seattle much. Although Hasselbeck looks like he's kind of put this thing in neutral. But the weather's great. Seahawks won here in '98. That was Ray Rhodes' last season, and he went to Green Bay for a year. Caught by Westbrook, he'll take that ball into Seattle territory to the 47-yard line with two and a half. Leroy Hill making the tackle. That's the thing that, that the Eagles like about Brian Westbrook is he's a running back who you can put all over the place. And and in that time he was lined up outside down here as a wide receiver. And and when he goes out there he's as good as a wide receiver. I mean he runs a slant as well as any wide receiver. Third and one now. To the 47 yard line and Westbrook will not get it. That'll take us to the two minute warning. I'm sure Reed will go for it here. Two minutes to play in the first half. Nothing to lose for Andy and company because Seattle has just been dominant in the first half. 28 to nothing, Seahawks. Week 13 highlights with Tim McGraw coming up. 60 seconds with Jimmy Kimmel as well. Highlights from Reggie White's number retirement ceremony as part of our Lexus halftime show. And the city of brotherly love. Is that guy sleeping right there? Well, I think he's just taking a little nap. I think he's waiting for a halftime ceremony. No, mm -hmm. he's, mm -hmm. he's resting his eyes. So I've seen enough of this. But it's fourth down. Fourth and one from the 47 yard line. Two minutes to play in the opening half. And Westbrook will not pick up the first down. 
Marquand Manuel on a safety blitz is the first to hit him. Seattle will get the ball. We'll go to Sam. And a former teammate, Alan John of Reggie, Keith Jackson, joining us here tonight. Keith, when you were drafted in 1988, Reggie was already here. When you first came in, first met Reggie, what was the first impression he left with you? You know, the first time I met Reggie White, he had such a sense of humor. The first thing he said to me, is this the guy we wasted the first round draft shorts on? He has a bird chest out of Oklahoma, and they never throw the ball at Oklahoma. And I said, I thought he'd be a preacher. I thought he'd be more serious than that, but he had a great sense of humor. No, just about everybody who's played with Reggie said he was such a great teammate. What was it about him that made him a great teammate? Well, I think because he was a leader when he had to be a leader. He was a friend when he had to be a friend. And you know, anytime you were dealing with Reggie White, he was treating you fairly. And that's just the way it was. And everybody respected that. Keith Jackson, thank you for your time. Thank Alan you. John. Hey, thank you, Sam. Keith Jackson, tremendous player in his own right. He's a, he's a tra he's in training camp. He's a rookie. He goes in there, and Reggie White is this big, dominant guy, and 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 the coaches say, "Okay, who wants to block Reggie? Who wants to go against him?" Keith said, "I will." He jumps up there, and rookie, and he gets ready, and you know, you know and Reggie gets down in that stance. He's going to kill. The, the ball snap. Keith jumps out of the way, and Reggie flops on his stomach. From the 47-yard line, Hassel back to the outside. Angle makes the catch. Close to a first down of the 43-yard line. Hasselback will bring him up to the line of scrimmage. If they want him, they've got all three timeouts. 28-0 lead. Trying to attack on a few more. Alexander to the 45-yard line. With the clock ticked down here. They're almost in the not pouring it on syndrome. Yeah, this is this is one of those things that's strange. I mean, I think you know when you have all your timeouts, you either get into a hurry up or you you start to use your timeouts. Maybe because he got stopped on that first down run, he doesn't want to give the ball back to the Eagles. Second and eleven. Hasselback's going to go deep. Into traffic, and that's caught as DJ Hackett adjusts with double coverage and comes back and makes the catch. At the three yard line, it'll be first down and goal and a timeout after a 42 yard pass reception. Yeah, DJ Hackett is a third wide receiver. He does a good job here, he keeps his hands down. You see, most defenders will look and read when you put your hands up. He kept his hands down, maybe got a little push off. And and Matt Hasselbeck just gets the ball up over the defenders outside shoulder. Back at 6'2, 199. Right, and he had the size advantage over Sheldon Brown there, but I like the way he kept his hands down and just waited until the ball got there. And then maybe by keeping his hands down, he was able to get a little push off on Sheldon Brown. Keep in mind, too, Seattle playing without Darryl Jackson, who's been a great receiver for them over the past few years. He's, he underwent knee surgery earlier. They hope to have him back perhaps next week when they meet the 49ers in Seattle. First down and goal now, Alexander with a flag. So Alexander seeking that 22nd touchdown in this their 12th game of the season. Scott Green. Defense. Nose tackle. Lining up in the neutral zone. Half the distance to the goal. First down. When you expect Seattle to run left here, I mean, you know that that they ran right on that one on first down. I think if you're going to go play action pass, this is a good down to do it. If you're not, if you're going to just pound it in there, then then just give it to Sean Alexander right in here behind these two guys, and that's not bad running. I would guess that's going to be the play. Well, they're going to send him on a sweep instead of the outside of the goal. Can he turn the corner? Yes, he can. Touchdown, Alexander. His second of the night is 22nd of the season, and with 29 seconds remaining in the first half, it is 34 to nothing. Max Strong also helping to lead the charge, the fullback. Max Strong in the left guard number 76. You see Steve Hutchinson pull there, turn up right there, make the block, cut Simino off, and that's what lets Sean Alexander get to the outside. 
Josh Brown for his fifth extra point. Do we have the start of a route here? <laughs> I think we had it after the first drive. Oh, oh we're in the middle the, of a route. Reset the play clock. But you just know when they get down there that they're going to run the ball to Sean Alexander and they're going to run it to the left. So Alexander seeking the rushing title this year, seeking a new NFL touchdown record. Brown with the extra point. It's 35 to nothing. Monday Night Football being brought to you by Southwest Airlines, proud sponsor of the NFL and official airline of Super Bowl 40. Refreshingly smooth Bud Light, always worth it. Citizen watches, Citizen Echo Drive, unstoppable. And Ford F-150 built for tough. City Hall, decorated for the holiday season here in Philadelphia. Now we saw Keith Jackson before. Of course, can't think of any Keith Jackson would think of our colleague Keith. I'll never forget when Keith Jackson, the player, is playing in Oklahoma, and Keith Jackson does them for the first time, and you know, he was, Keith Jackson was a, a fine player in college, and he, he's announcing Keith Jackson scoring a touchdown, and he's rumbling to the end zone. <laughs> touchdown, Keith Jackson. No relation. <laughs> <laughs> Well, KJ and Dan Fox will have a some beauty on the fourth night of January, SC in Texas. Whew. Which one of the Keith Jacksons was the other Keith Jackson? That's a good question. Well, you know, the, the player Keith Jackson was the other Keith Jackson. And then, and then I think they became, they were both about as, as, as well known as two people in football can be. So maybe there was no other Keith Jackson, but this, but this Keith Jackson was a great player too, and mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, and he was one of those guys, a lot like Reggie White. You know, not all all good players are, are good guys off the field, and you know, one doesn't make for the other. But Reggie, you know, off the field was the greatest guy as he was a player on the field, and, and Keith Jackson was a lot that way too. His extra win. One of them, Keith Jackson, that we were talking about possum hunting moons, John, about a month ago. We were wondering right. what it was. So Keith Jackson, our Keith Jackson, tells Malibu Kelly Hayes, well, it's a moon, but it's, it's, a, um, it's a waxing moon. So, when, you know, it's, that's the possum hunting moon. So I called right. Dan Faust. I said, wait a second. Why can't it be a waning moon? Because the waning moon is kind of the, the mirror of a waxing moon. And Faust, he said, it's because all the possum were dead by then. <laughs> The last full moon we had, the last full moon we had, I think, was a frosty moon, wasn't it? It was a frosty moon. And if you're tuning in and wondering what in the world we're talking about, just take a look at the score. And that is caught up at the 39-yard line. And then it's not. It's incomplete. It was 16 seconds intended for L.J. Smith. You know, some things, sometimes when things just start to run away there's nothing you can do about getting them back and I know you say you know what would you do as a coach you know if you're Andy Reid what do you say at halftime and you know the only thing you can do is say you know let's play it like zero to zero and I think both sides will do that but you know when you're down 35 to nothing I don't know how much they listen to that mm. Joe Underwood with a Westbrook one and that is that's about as miserable as it can get for a home crowd. Snowing, 32 degrees, five and six. Used to tremendous success, 35 to nothing Seattle at the half. Coming up next to Lexus Halftime Show when we come back after this message from the National Football League. A word from our ABC stations. The Seattle Seahawks come into Philadelphia with the best record in the conference nine and two and are having one of those nights you dream about two touchdowns on interception returns and they lead thirty five to nothing as we conclude week 13 some of the highlights yesterday of course Bengals make a statement where they went against Pittsburgh Indy stays unbeaten Giants win a big one in the Meadowlands over the Dallas Cowboys some of the highlights now as we join Tim McGraw for week 13 highlights. Welcome to December football, Monday night style. Hey, there's a lot of football in these last four weeks to be played. Erlacher's crew's playing like that 85 D. Wow! 
defense needed to come up with something big. They did. Houston gets a leg up in the Reggie Bush lottery. Unbelievable. It happens again. Pittsburgh's looking icky in more ways than one. The thin storm back under the Miami sun. Rondé Barber strikes like a cat upon a mouse. A different indie triplet takes it to the house. Denver shootout reminds us of the Wild West days. Wow, what a beautiful blow. Who would have thought the Vikings would continue their winning ways? Touchdown! Yeah, baby! Yeah! Portis runs one in on possession number two. The Bolts beat the Raiders, silver, black, and blue. Straight hand and big blue have the Cowboys seeing red. Carolina's ready to put this one. Philadelphia, Seattle on top of the Eagles, 35 to nothing during the first half. John and I talking about the similarities between the two coaches. Andy Reid of Philadelphia, Mike Holmgren of Seattle. Jimmy Kimmel has noticed as well. Here's 60 seconds with Jimmy. Well, thank you, Al. Here's a question plaguing Americans tonight. How do you tell the difference between Mike Holmgren and Andy Reid? Mike Holmgren and Andy Reid truly are the Olsen twins of football. This is Mike Holmgren, the Mary Kate, and here's Andy Reid, the Ashley. Ashley's coach of the Eagles, whereas Mary Kate watches over the Seahawks. Similar, yes, but if you look closely at their faces, you can see they're exactly the same. It's like trying to tell two polar bears apart. So how do you? It's time to play the brand new game show, Which Coach Is This? <laughs> Our contestant tonight, five-time Pro Bowler and NFL Network analyst Sterling Sharp. Hi, Sterling. Hi, Sterling played under both Mike Holmgren and Andy Reid. He should know the difference. Are you ready to play the game? I'm ready to play. All right. Which coach is this, Holmgren or Reid? Holmgren. Correct. Which coach is this, Reid or Holmgren? Holmgren. Correct. Holmgren or Reid? Reid. Correct. Reid or Holmgren? Craig Stadler. That's absolutely correct. Congratulations, Sterling Sharp. I don't know what you won, but we're out of time. Join me tonight after Nightline with guests Ted Danson, Julie Bowen, and Floetry. We'll see you next time on Which Coach Is This? And back we come now to Philadelphia. Reggie White, they just had the ceremony, his number 92 retired, a very moving ceremony. At midfield, a lot of his teammates, coaches here as well, the family. And that is the way Reggie will be memorialized here at Lincoln Financial Field. And of course, a very emotional night for Reggie's widow and Mike Holmgren who helped bring Reggie to Green Bay comes out onto the field and his team at the half leading by a score of 35 to nothing and let's go down to Sam Ryan Sam 
Yeah, and an emotional moment for Sarah White here, Reggie's widow. Now, this is the second time this has been done this season. It was third time with the um, University of Tennessee, so this is the third time. Well, that being said, it was also done in Green Bay. How? Wh what do you take of this weekend, you and your family? What did it mean to you? You know what? Um, Jeff Laurie has been so hospitable, and the and the fans of Green Bay, and all the players, and I take it in with as a celebration, but it's just so emotional as well because still a reminder that he's not here. Your daughter singing the anthem before the game, Reggie's daughter, the, the fans chanting Reggie. Did you hear that and what did you think? Yes, and it meant so much to Jacoya because they were just so supportive. Because, you know, Philadelphia has hard fans. So for them just to welcome her and embrace her and um, just cheer for her and stand up for her, it was, it was wonderful. She felt really great about it. Now, we know Reggie's a finalist for the Pro Football Hall of Fame. He's said in the past that he'd like to go in as a Green Bay Packer, but Philadelphia is first team. He's had plenty of success here in Philadelphia. What did he, how did he view his time here in Philadelphia, Sarah? Oh, you know what? It was the beginning of his career. We were young. He enjoyed his time here. He met some fabulous people that were lifelong friends. He, he, he loved it here as far as the, the companionship with the, with the guys and Buddy Ryan. And um, I, he never really made a commitment where he was going in as. He never told me, you know, how he was going in. He was going in as Reggie White. Okay, and we will probably see the White family in Canton over the summer, Al. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you. Thank you. Sam, I would, I think we can count on that, John. Yeah, we can. And, uh, you know, when you, when you look at, you know, great players and, and who's the best, I think Reggie White was the, the best and most dominant defensive lineman that ever played. And I mean, he could play the run. He could he could rush the passer. He could you know he could do everything that a player had to do. And then, then off the field, he was very inspirational to everyone. To account for him on every play as the second hand kickoff is taken by Dexter Win. And Win gets flung out of bounds up at the 28-yard line. The Eagles, a franchise that began in 1933 take a look at that largest halftime deficit you have to go back to 62 against Green Bay and that at Dallas 35 points down at the half and 69 and then tonight you know and I'm not sure if we're seeing a, a really good Seattle Seahawks team or a really bad Philadelphia Eagles team which is an interesting point as most toss up the ball and will they get another return for a touchdown indeed they will Andre Dyson is going to score his second touchdown of the night one on an interception return this on a fumble return the rookie Moats losing the football and Dyson goes into the end zone you're going to see Moats is in a single back here and 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 he just goes to make the cutback and Leroy Hill gets in there and makes the hit and just knocks the ball out of there. I mean, there was no play. Leroy Hill gets penetration right there. And as he goes to make the tackle, he takes his left hand and strips it right out of Ryan Motes' hands. But that, you know, as a back, when you see that and the guy gets penetration, you just have to put both arms around it and just go down. 25-yard return. The extra point is good. That's six. And again, Dyson, who had shortness of breath after the interception return, this time he comes hobbling off the field. So for Dyson, a tough physical night. But what a monster night when any defender can score two touchdowns, as he has done tonight. But this is a different matter here. Yeah, he picked the ball up. I mean, the guy who really made that play was Leroy Hill. So the work on Dyson three returns for touchdowns. Of course the numbers going the whole thing. Two of those returned for touchdowns. So there's not that much disparity in the numbers but it's simply a matter of you know Seattle just cashing in on on any Philadelphia mistake and Philadelphia unable to mount anything. You know you look at stats in, in any game and the, and the biggest one and the one that that kills you the most is turnovers. I mean, you can have, you know, yards, yards per carry, you know, yards per throw and all those things, and they're all good and important, but the most important stat is, is turnover ratio.
Josh Brown is at a busy night kicking off and kicking extra points. And you kick off a lot, you know you've had a happy night. Reno Mahe. Taken down by Dexter Wynn. Wynn who runs it back. Wynn gets taken down up at the 24 yard line. And Coy Detmer will start the second half after Mike McMahon was very ineffective. Four out of 10 for 61 yards in his time in there. 42 to nothing. Yeah, 21 for the defense, 21 for the offense. Now John, you talked about you don't know if Seattle's that good, Philly's that bad. Mike Hunter telling us last night, he said, you know, I, I don't know quite how good we are, despite a 9 and 2 record. As Ryan Boats picks up nine. But the one thing we do know, John, they, they lost a lot of very agonizing, excruciating games in the last couple of years, including that one of the playoffs to St. Louis. And this year, they're winning those games. Yeah, and I think, you know, you know, he feels that the defense is different. The, that the defense just hangs in there and plays for 60 minutes. He felt that, you know, a year ago, maybe the defense would let up towards the end of the game. And he said, these guys, there's, there's no let up in this group. They may not be the most talented, but they're not going to let up. The first down. They won a game that they pulled out of a, a hat against Dallas with an interception at the end. And out of nowhere, they beat the Cowboys in Seattle. They staved off a two point conversion at San Francisco a couple of weeks back to, to win that game. And then Feely last week missing those three field goals in Seattle. That's the kind of game that they would, would have lost in the past. Right, but they just hang in there, hang in there, hang in there, and then you know, you know, make the plays when you have to. From the 34 on first and 10. Pressure, near sack, gets it away. And that one is intended for Brown and incomplete. Manuel came in and put the heat on that time. Yeah, and that was from his backside, and, and uh, Coy Detmer didn't even see that. And, Manuel had a free shot at him and he went over the top. You know, that's the thing. You always want to make sure and you never want to go that high in the guy where he can he can duck under you. Seattle has already clinched the West. So they will go to the playoffs. They are guaranteed a home game now. And what they're trying to do is avoid the wild card round and be the number one seed and just play at home in the second week of the playoffs. That run the pressure again. You know, in the Giants, you talk about missing the kicks back there in, in Seattle. That's a tough place to play, too. You know, it's not a dome, but it's very loud. I mean, it could be one of the loudest stadiums in football. And, and you know, you talk about, you know, if they get that, that home field advantage throughout, that can be a very, very difficult place to play. There's the wild card race right now. Tampa would be the five seed, then Dallas, Atlanta, and Minnesota. Are all seven and five, and you've got Washington. And, and of all things, Dyson will, will get a cart ride back to the locker room after scoring two touchdowns. Pressure again, and another sack. Bryce Fisher will get that sack, and the update on Dyson now from Sam. Now he has a left ankle sprain. His return is doubtful. Allie does have those two touchdowns on the game, but that may be it for Andre Dyson with a left ankle sprain. Pretty good night's work. And there was the sprain right there as he gets taken down by the shirt, too, and run back by Jimmy Williams to the 40. The Seattle Seahawks, 12.40 left in the third, and they know they're going to have a very happy plane ride home. 42 zip. Well, what Mike Holmgren saying to Sean Alexander here is probably you're done for the night. The game is in hand. We have a long way to go. I need your man down the stretch. We're not going to take any chances. We have Maurice Morris in there. And John, who would have who would have ever thought? I mean, with with Alexander, and again, now you're th thinking about individual situations. He has a chance with the rushing touchdown record. He's a chance to lead the league in rushing, which was a source of. Uh, a lot of controversy last year when he didn't win it, but you know, if you're Mike Holmgren, you'd have to take him out of the game here. Yeah, you have to, and and these would be very easy yards for Sean Alexander. But 
at, at, at some point you have to have to give that up. I mean, he's healthy. He's been healthy all year. He was healthy coming into this game. And if you can get him out of Philadelphia being healthy, that's a good thing. Morris again. In the backfield. Taking down. Last year, Alexander was very upset because Curtis Martin won the Russian title by a yard. He felt he could have had a carry to get him that title. And then he had a contract situation as well. And Westbrook is going to go back to the locker room. They put the franchise tag on Alexander. They promise they won't do it again next year. It'll be interesting to see what happens. But the feeling seems to be that they will be able to sign him to a long term deal in Seattle and he was telling us last night he'd like to remain a Seahawk if possible. You know, it was interesting what, what he did when they franchised him. Of course that's a, a one year contract. Then he went and got insurance and the combination of the two worked pretty well. Max Strong. And when you're franchised you get the the average of the top five running backs in the league. If you're a free agent and again we talked about it last week with Edger and James in Indianapolis the Colts gave James the opportunity to make a deal for himself but he couldn't in terms of you know get, getting the contract that he wanted at this particular point one of Alexander might not be in that same position as Reno Mahe I'll tell you what I bet you if you give him a do over on Edron James there'd be some takers now mm -hmm. yep right now those guys are one two and rushing Alexander one James 2, 10.40 left in the third, 42 zip. Reminding you it's only satisfying if you eat it. White snow in Philadelphia. It's been snowing for about four and a half hours now. The parking lot. Looks like one of those glass things that you you know you pick up and you turn it upside down and then it goes. <laughs> it's, it's that kind of snow. You know my tackled by Hill Holmgren and Reed. We talked about him and we've got a clip from when they were together at Green Bay. Mike is the head coach and Andy is the assistant. What happened on the screen? Why did we run that's that? My, that's me. Why? That's me. Why is it you? That's me. I sent in the wrong thing. The formation? Right up short. I sent it in. Well, get to the first 15. Let's go. And then look at Brett Favre. Look at that impish smile. Yeah, he knew that Andy was taking one for him. Yes, he was. And you know what? You could smile about that because if you notice on the graphic, it's August. So that was a preseason game. Right. And the and Andy right, used pass. to do that. You know. False start. Number 69. Offense. Five yard penalty. Second down. John Runyon. Now, now, sometimes Brett Favre would just drive Mike Holmgren crazy with things he did, and Andy was a quarterback coach, Ed, and he was he was kind of the buffer between. Brett Favre and Mike Holmgren. <laughs> <laughs> That's Brett Favre. Yeah, yeah. Mike's all serious. Andy's, Andy's spooking and Brett's laughing. We know Mahi up to the 24 yard line. And you know, we were talking about Holmgren and, and the guys he has spawned. It's pneumonia in waiting. And, uh, of course, Mike goes back, and Mike comes from that that Bill Walsh tree. San Francisco. Third and ten. Over the middle, attacks made here by L.J. Smith after the 44 and a first down. Coach connection right there. Ray Rhodes and Steve Mariucci, John Gruden, Andy Reid, Dick Duran, Mike Sherman, who went with Mike Holmgren to Seattle and took over in Green Bay, and Marty Morningweg, who was the head coach at Detroit, now is the assistant head coach here under Andy Reid. 44 yard line. You know, it was interesting you say that, you know, the Bill Walsh tree and it kind of started with Bill and the West Coast offense and Holmgren and, you know, and they took it different places and Mike Shanahan, you know, you took it. They all went in different directions. And I was talking to Bill Walsh today and, you know, the guy that he's impressed with and the offense that he's impressed with right now, Tom Moore. 
Really? Yeah. Well, that's well. In fact, he was asking me how old Tom Moore is because he was saying there's a guy that ought to be a head coach. I mean, the things that he's doing and the and the what the Colts are doing. Bill Wall says is the most impressive offense he's seen in a long time. Well, we know that we know that Tom Moore is 68 because we wished him a happy birthday on the air when we had Indianapolis uh, a few weeks ago. But you know, Tom, you know, it's 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 a it's an amazing thing. A guy like Tom Moore, not one of the you know really well-known assistants, but I mean, he's been there since Manning has been there, and of course now. He's the offensive coordinator of an undefeated team. And you're right, you don't think about a guy like that. And the things that he are, that he's doing, you know, like Bill Walsh said, if there was a job open where, you know, they had a pretty good offense and they needed a, a system, he, he could very well be that guy. And that's dropped along the sideline by McMullen. I don't want to give away any secrets, but you know the book the book list Tom is 67, but I know he told me 68 when I was going to wish him a happy birthday on the field that night. So yeah, he whatever. probably is, but that's <laughs> one of the things, you know, you say, you know, who's going to be the head coaches when these other coaches lose their jobs and to me the best coordinators are older guys. I mean, Tom Moore is one of the best. Jim Johnson here is one of the best. Monty Kiffin down in Tampa, but they're all older. 17-yard line, Jimmy Williams. Back up to the 26, seven and a half minutes to go in the third quarter. Been a lot of fun for the Seahawks. No fun for Philadelphia. Well, the NBA on ABC will begin Christmas with a doubleheader. World champion Spurs against the Detroit Pistons in the opener and then the Lakers and the Miami Heat in the nightcap at three o'clock Eastern time NBA back on ABC on the 25th Maurice Morris the running back with Alexander done for the night and Morris to the outside out of bounds he goes talking John last night about now, Andy Reid was very instrumental in the Green Bay Packers drafting Matt Hasselbeck. Yeah, Ron Wolf was the general manager of the Packers at that time, and Andy Reid was a quarterback coach, and, and Ron Wolf gave him a list of 18 quarterbacks. And he said the 18th name was Matt Hasselbeck, and he said it was in alphabetical order. Now, that's how they, they had him rated, and he went in and worked him out. And, and was really impressed with him. Not only, you know, on the field, but maybe even more in the classroom. This is Morris. Of course, Matt. So Andy Dad Reed, Dom, Dom yeah. played professional football. Yeah, right. And and Andy Reid, you know, was, uh, you know, the reason that Matt Hasselbeck, you know, went to Green Bay. And he said Matt was saying that one of the things that he had him do was draw up his favorite play. And Matt said, you know, against what? And he said, just draw up your favorite play against anything. So he said, okay. He said, I drew up a play that I thought would be good against any coverage. And Andy kind of said, yeah, that's that's good. That's a good play. And then, then they kind of went from there and went out on the field. And Andy knew that this guy really had it all. I mean, he had the mind to be a quarterback. And then he had the other abilities to be a quarterback. And Matt Hasselbeck was saying that Andy Reid told him a story about Brett Favre, and Andy had asked Brett Favre to draw up his favorite pass play. And Brett Favre, as only Brett Favre would do, he drew up a hook and ladder. It, it would figure either that or a pass or a pass play where he catches it, as he did on the first pass he ever completed in the NFL. Well, that could have been the ladder or lateral part of it. You know, we. He would, he would throw a hook, and then the hook guy would lateral to someone, and then the guy would lateral to him. That was probably the play. Morris again. Hasselbeck's bad Don, a tight end with New England primarily years ago in the, in the AFL. And then his brother, Tim, is the number two quarterback with the New York Giants. So it's not that far-fetched at this point. You know, I'm not getting ahead of ourselves here, but uh, you got perspective like NFC championship game Hasselbeck versus well Manning and with Hasselbeck in reserve you know that's that's one of the things we'll be getting to between now and the end of the season I think it's easy in the AFC to say the Colts are the best who's the best team in the NFC well after well, you know after tonight 
a lot of people well, two things are going to happen here I mean there will be some people who say well you know I guess Seattle's for real and then other people will say well you know, Philadelphia is terrible well but, you know, they're still 10 and 2 and they're going to right now win an eighth straight game will the Seahawks yeah and, and I think you know we go back to the original thing are we watching a, a bad Philadelphia team or a very good Seattle team or maybe someplace in the middle and maybe we're all like Mike Holmgren you know we still don't know about this team and it may be a while before you know about him because next week they play San Francisco as Mahi brings it back and then they've got that big game with Indianapolis but as we began to discuss last week that could be a game that doesn't mean anything to either of these teams 440 to go in the third Seattle 42 and Philadelphia nothing. as you look at Independence Hall we go to Atlanta next week Saints Falcons on Monday night Mike Vick and company Brett Favre in action Packers hosting the Lions ESPN Sunday night at 830 here's Detmer on first down Philadelphia down 42 nothing and dropped by Mahi out in the flat. Well, happy to report that young Tyler is doing very well. Michelle Tafoy on paternity leave. Michelle will be back in a couple of weeks. So the couch reporter wants to know how we compare Alexander and Tomlinson and has won the league MVP. Good question. Which NFC team is the best? We can debate that. Now, will Lamar could finish up or down this year? Michelle, it's, it's got to be. It's got to be up because it's already up too much after that November. But I'll see what they say on Squawk Box tomorrow. I think Alexander is the better inside runner. Tomlinson the better outside runner. But I think when you go to MVP in this league right now, I think you have to go to the Indianapolis Colts. Back to Manning? Yeah, I think you have to go to Peyton Manning. Prior to the snap, false start, offense, number 89, five-yard penalty, second down. Chad Lewis. Yeah, I mean, Manning got off to, you know, for him a slow start this year. And then all of a sudden, you know, Peyton's numbers, while they're not going to match last year with 49 touchdowns, they don't have to. But he has been fabulous. So has James. You can look at him as well. Right. And and I think I think one of those two guys is the direction I would go if you had to pick an MVP right now. But, of course, we don't. Second and 15. So also wanted to know which team is the best in the NFC. And, you know, again, that's... At this point, I mean, you've got these guys, the Chicago Bears. I mean, who in the world would have thought that, especially when they lose Rex Grossman at the onset of the season? I mean, everybody's forgetting about Carolina. Yeah, that's a team that I wouldn't forget about. I wouldn't I wouldn't count the Panthers out, especially it looks like they got a running game going now. Tough defense. Uh, I don't know that that's not a way you want to go. I mean, you know, as we get closer to the playoffs, the running game and the defense become more and more important. Third and nine. And was his arm coming forward? The whistle indicating that the ball was alive, and indeed that's what they're going to say, and it wasn't, and it's going to be Marcus Tubbs who comes up with the fumble recovery. Andy Reid is saying, how in the heck can any more of these things happen to us? So Detmer with the empty hand coming forward. Joe Tafoya knocked it loose. Speaking of Tafoya. Andy Reid is challenging this. He's going to contend that this was a forward pass and not a fumble. We have an interesting angle on this play here because his arm is coming forward, but is the ball out before Tafoya even makes contact? It looks like he's beginning to lose his grip on the ball. It comes out as his arm begins to come forward, and this would be a case where it would be ruled a fumble. If I that, would think that's a fumble. It looks like it comes out the back door. I mean, one yeah. shot, it looks like Joe Tafoya hits it, mm -hmm. but on the other shot, the ball starts to come out out the back of his hand before Tafoya even gets there. Scott Green. I say it's a fumble. What do you say? I, I think it's a fumble too. After reviewing the play, the ruling on the field stands. The quarterback's arm 
Did not move forward with possession of the ball. First down, Seattle. Philadelphia's charged with a timeout. Yep, exactly as we saw it. So they do not win the challenge. Yet another, it's five turnovers. And of course, the Seahawks with 28 points off turnovers, three of them just in and of themselves run backs for touchdowns, two on picks, one on a fumble. And we could be seeing another seven coming up right here off a of turnover. Meanwhile, that's it for Hasselback, and we're going to see Seneca Wallace drafted in the fourth round in 2003. He's only 5'11", 196, third year. But is he exciting? Oh, no, very. Out of Iowa State. And again, it's Morris who's taken over for Alexander here. And he'll see his biggest workload of the season. Meanwhile, the defense tonight. After Seattle had scored on its opening drive, you had this interception right here by Dyson. You had this pick right here by Tatuku. And then the fumble picked up, scooped up by Dyson, who scores again 21 points from the defense alone. Yeah, they took the quarterback out. You know who else they took out? The left tackle. Walter Jones is not in there now. The best of all worlds is Trotter makes the tackle. You're going to win the game. You're going to remain as the number one seed in the conference. You're going to win in the Eastern time zone. You have a short week. You're going to go home to after that long flight to, to play San Francisco. But your key guys are going to get plenty of rest tonight. Yeah, and, and those are his Pro Bowl players. I mean, he takes out his quarterback, Matt Hasselbeck. He takes out his, his running back, Sean Alexander. He takes out his best offensive lineman, Walter Jones. And I would think Steve Hutchinson could very well be the next guy's left guard. I think Largent's coming out pretty soon as well. Now third and 11. Wallace rolling. And the pass is incomplete. Chased by Curse. Yeah, here's Walter Jones who the other thing that I've always liked about him is, is he's a good run blocker too. Just watch him get on his guy and stay on him. I mean you know most most tackles are good pass protectors left tackle but this guy is as good a one of run blocker as he is a pass protector. Gonna have a 40 yard field goal attempt right now for Josh Brown. And it's about the only thing that's gone wrong for Seattle tonight. No good. The Bronx this, here in Philadelphia. Yeah, this, this crowd's going crazy. Yeah. So it remains 42 to nothing. The Seahawks formed in 1976, inaugural season in the league, and you go back to Chuck Knox as the coach, but they haven't won a playoff game since 84. Largent went into the Hall of Fame, only Seahawks player. Holmgren came in as the fifth coach in the history of the franchise. And now you have a fourth division title, a 13th winning season. But can they get off that playoff schneid? And Motes, tackled by Manuel and Tatuku. You know that's what happens when a when a defense obviously when they get ahead 42 to nothing you can do anything you want on defense but when they have no respect for the passing game I and mean, they just have nine ten guys just everyone right up there at the line of scrimmage and and they're just pressing the run I mean you can just see they're not they're not backing off the safeties are up there the corners are up there the linebackers are right up in the line there's nothing to drop for. Reggie Brown, they're going to rule that a catch. Philadelphia, if you're thinking about a third quarterback, they don't have one right now. So you had McNabb go down, and they didn't bring another guy in, McMahon and Detmer. I know who their third quarterback is because I saw him in practice the other day. You know who it would be if they had to play a third quarterback? There he is right there, Mike Bart. Right, the, the long snapper. Yep, the long snapper. Mm -hmm. And he practices as a quarterback, too. I mean, he, he gets in and he, he takes reps. Third and seven. He was recruited, was Bartram. 
as a quarterback in college. Greg Lewis was the intended receiver there. Whereas for the Eagles, you go back to, and we were here three weeks ago, and you talk about the roof caving in on one play. He's when the Eagles as Landetta kicks it to Jimmy Williams. I mean, Philadelphia is still in the hunt. Despite that, some, we're going through the, the whole Owens thing, all that turmoil. And then McNabb fighting through injury, and this is a game they should have won. And then this, Roy Williams with the interception. And Dallas pulls off a miracle win, and then McNabb gets hurt. So you lose your quarterback, you lose your, the game, and in effect, the season went down the drain as well on one play. Yeah, because, you know, as you say, they had Dallas beaten. I mean, they had dominated them the whole way. And even if they just run the ball out there, they probably would have been okay. But then, you know, McNabb throws that interception to Roy Williams. There's no one out there. And then, you know, being the competitor he is and the instincts, he goes to make the tackle, to make the tackle. And then that's the end of the season. And again, to go back. An opening night in Atlanta in the Monday night game as Morris picks up about four. McNabb was hurt, suffered what they call a sports hernia, played through it for half a season, knew he'd need surgery at the end of the season, started to feel, according to Donovan, a little bit better. He was becoming more mobile at that point. And then they have that game in hand, and the next thing you know, good night, Donovan, good night game, good night 2005. Yeah, and I and I think it started before that. I think the you know Terrell Owens thing was a, was a big part of it, and that you know two sides. I mean, one you know off the field, you know Andy Reid did what he had to do, but on the field, I mean Terrell Owens was a big big playmaker and touchdown maker. End of the third, Seattle 42, Philadelphia nothing, and Monday Night Football is back after this message from our ABC station. Fourth quarter begins in the history of the league. The largest margin of defeat in a season after a Super Bowl appearance would be Denver losing to New Orleans 42 to nothing, which is the score right now back in 1988. Fourth quarter begins. Al Michaels, John Madden, and Sam Ryan, and Seneca Wallace fumbles. Morris picks the ball up, and Javon Kirk creates another fumble. And the Philadelphia Eagles may have recovered, but they're going to say that it was Seattle ball because it was down by contact on the initial fumble. He never he never got that, that that snap and then instead of handing it to the ball carrier he kicked it back to the ball carrier. So that was about three fumbles on one play. And the Seahawks still have the ball. You're going to rule that he was down there. But didn't hear the whistle. And maybe there will be a challenge here. Timeout. Seattle. This is their first charge timeout. Well, it can't be. I mean, if the whistle had blown, I assume it had to have, even though we didn't hear it. There is no challenge. Timeout. I really can't stay. Get rid of that hold on. How about it's cold? Considerably colder tonight for Philadelphia than for Seattle. Third and 17 after the half time. It's Morris. Did you notice the, 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 the funny thing on that play before on the fumble? The Seahawks put their number one draft choice in as the center, Chris Spencer. Gave him one play and he didn't get the ball up. Here he is here. He's number 65. He doesn't, he doesn't get the ball up to Seneca Wallace. So Mike Holmgren, even though he has this big lead, he takes his number one draft choice, puts him in for one play, fumbles, it takes him out. Toback goes back in. Yeah, Robbie Toback says thanks a lot. Yeah. He's probably over there having a cup of that cider. The right. next thing he knows, he's back in the game. Back in. Reno Mahi. Out to the 46-yard line. If you don't succeed at first, try, try again. So Spencer and Wallace doing a little snapping on the sideline. 
You know, the great thing about our producer, Fred Goodelli on the left, and Drew Esikoff, our director in the middle, and Joey Abenda reading the paper on the right, these guys are just like us. You know, they're not going to be in, in warm, toasty trucks. They're going to live with the elements the way we do. They over, opened up the doors tonight, and, and we're proud of you guys. Phenomenal work. And they play hurt. They, they play, well, they really play hurt. Ryan Motes, tackled by Jordan Babineau. Well, for Philadelphia, we, you know, we've talked about what's going on this season before it's headlined by Owens. But Corey Simon didn't sign a contract, wound up going to Indianapolis. Derek Burgess left to go to Oakland. They lost Jermaine Mayberry, the guard. He went to New Orleans. Not that you can't withstand those losses. A lot of teams, you know, lose guys in the offseason. But then you just compound it with the Owens thing and the McNabb injury. And Buck Holter getting hurt in, in, in training camp and on and on and on. It's gone. Tupu makes the tackle behind the line of scrimmage. And don't forget Todd Pinkston. He would have been the, the other wide out next to Owens. He was gone, and Hank Fraley, they lost him in midseason to a shoulder injury. Trey Thomas, a pro bowler. Owens, McNabb, Lito Shepard, Brian Westbrook spraining a foot tonight. Hasn't played uh, very much. You know, I don't, I don't know if it really has anything to do with it, but sometimes I think, I, I think, I think losing, you know, makes you have more injury. You ever notice? We did three Indianapolis Colts games this year, and they had the same guys playing every game. They never had an injury. Through Mahi's hands. It's, well, it's one of those years, and we, you know, we've seen it for year after year. You need a little bit of luck, and maybe it does come with, with winning, but the teams that, that go the farthest are the teams that, for the most part, don't have those those injuries that can take you your season and just to send it into a dumpster. And I think that's one of the big reasons for the Colts this year. Better with a mini shank job and you get a flag down. I mean better gets contacted so you might have a running into the kicker. Looked like it was right down there by the snapper. About Mike Bartram. It's going to be a hold. It was fourth down Holding. and 11. Offense, 88. Penalty is declined. First down. That was Mike Bartram, the holder. He was holding way, way back. And number three quarterback. Welcome back to the Iditarod. As you take a look at the numbers for the Eagles quarterbacks, Tonight, three interceptions, two of them run back for touchdowns. McMahon started, then Detmer. Now you've got Seneca Wallace and Chris Spencer. The center does come back. Morris. You know, John, there's always a story you want to tell when you're on the air for years. You just don't have the time to do it, as you know, as you love to say, a game breaks out. I'm doing a college football game for ABC in 1978. Frank Broyles is my partner great coach he just retired as the Arkansas coach and still is the AD and I'm talking about coaching trees so we're doing the game at Stanford we meet with the coach we get back in the car 10 minute ride to the production meeting and I'll never forget Frank says to me he says you know that young coach we just met with he is the most impressive young coach I have ever been around Stanford 1978 as long as it to Morris because that man's name Bill Walsh. was Bill Walsh. And Bill Walsh then gets hired by the 49ers in 79, and the rest is history. And on they go to the Super Bowl championships and Bill to the Hall of Fame. And just in that one hour and a half meeting, Frank spotted him and said, the most impressive young coach I have ever seen. Well, you know, yeah, I mean, I mean, Bill was very, very impressive as an assistant. And then and then he went he went there to Cincinnati with Paul Brown and I think that you, know, you talk about the all time great mm -hmm. coaches and Paul Brown was one of those guys and I think Bill was bright and, and knew a lot about football before that but I think I think he really developed his mind with Paul Brown in Cincinnati. In Cincinnati that was before Stanford and then on to San Francisco and I swear to you in the second five minutes of that conversation I've told you the story off there of course. The other thing Broyles says to me, and Frank from Arkansas, he said, we have 
a young man who's the attorney general down here. Someday he'll be the president of the United States. Of course, I've never heard of the guy at that point. So 14 years later, when Bill Clinton gets elected, I had to call Frank. I mean, after the Walsh Clinton Quinella, and I said, "Now listen." I said, "Who do you like in the fourth at Santa Anita tomorrow?" Frank knows his people. You don't know <laughs> Frank knows his horses. His horses, exactly. <laughs> And there are some people you just know that. I mean, you you know, you talk to them. You know, this this one is this person is something special. They're going to be someone or something. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that was that was a pretty good call. So I'll tell one that I've always wanted to tell, and it's about Reggie White, and you know, and being an inspiration. Reggie always wanted a bus like mine. And he'd always say, hey, give me a bus like you. Now, I know Reggie well, and Reggie meant free. You know, he wanted a free bus. Well, anyway, to make a long story short, Reggie finally got a bus. And he gets it out in California, drives it all the way across the country. So I said, where'd you get the drivers? And he said, I drove it. And I said, well, did you have another driver? He said, yes, Sarah. He said, Sarah and I drove it across the country. I said, well, where'd you take the lessons? He said, we didn't take any lessons. I said, oh, I got great. drivers. I mean, I think it's like flying an airplane. I never touched my bus. This is in Green Bay. It's a true story. I went out in the parking lot, and I said, look, if Reggie can do it and Sarah can do it, and I said, hey, did you sleep when Sarah was driving? And he said, yeah, I slept when Sarah was driving. I said, okay, if Sarah can drive it and you can drive the bus, it can't be that hard. I went out in the parking lot. I told my drivers, I said, let me get in here. I'm going to drive this thing. And I started driving it around the parking lot in Green Bay. Now that's inspiration from Reggie White. Unbelievable. Mahe from the 28. Now that's a woman. Brings home the bacon, cooks it, and drives a bus. Yeah, and then I talked to Sarah about that, and she said, not only that, of course he could sleep when I drove, because I was a lot better driver than he was. <laughs> John, the elements finally got to the boys downstairs. Yep, blew right through the, into the truck. The whole thing, Steve Nagelson in the back row, he's already under two feet of snow. But on we go from the 39-yard line on first down. That throws, and that pass is incomplete. You know, getting back to the Seattle Seattle team, I think I think they have plenty of offense. And again, the the defense, you know, we talked about Mike Holmgren saying I'm not sure exactly how good we are. I really don't know this team that well. And that has to be the part. But the longer they can go, I mean, you have these young guys and they have you know high motors and all that stuff. Then the more they play, pretty soon they're not young, inexperienced guys. And I think I think I think that's where. They're getting a little help tonight. I think if I had an offensive lineman, I could take and say, "Okay, pick one." I think right now I'd take that guy. Well, mm. snap, ball start, left guard, offense, five-yard penalty, second down. Jones become a he's become a perennial Pro Bowler. Ninth year, taking the first round back in '97. Yeah, remember for three or four years he was a franchise player and he'd never go to training camp and he'd come in the week the season would start. They finally signed him to a long-term contract this year. And Orlando Pace was taking a page out of his book too. And then he did the same thing and I think Orlando Pace signed the contract mm -hmm. this year. But those are those are two of the best one Jonathan Ogden you know is in that group but I think I think that this guy is probably a better run blocker than those guys. And when you've got Alexander running behind you, it's one of the reasons that Sean almost won the rushing title last year. He is out in front this season as we head into the second week of December. You know, Mahe with the catch. Ball loose. Stays down. You know, one thing that has has impressed me about this about this Seattle Seahawks defense, Owen. So and of course, I know they're ahead 42 to nothing and all that, but 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 they've tackled well, and I think I think I think that's a big thing today. As the season goes on, you know, it, teams seem to get get beaten down a little, and then their tackling starts to slide. But but this team looked like a pretty good tackling team. Yeah. 
Sean Landetta wanted to get a practice <laughs> shot in. The same thing. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> Stay warm. It was an ugly practice Illegal shot. Illegal snap though. infraction. Center. Five yard penalty. Fourth down. Bartram again. Yeah, well, he got canned the last time. Remember when he was called for that holding penalty? They just canned him, just ran right over him. He was on his back and grabbing the guy who was on top of him, and they, they called him for a holding penalty. And now he's having an infraction. He's trying to keep that guy off him. You know, you can't do that in high school football. You can't do it in college football. Get over the center like, oops, like that, and can him. Nico Kudavidis. That his punt will go out at about the 22 yard line. Well, Dyson may be back in the locker room with that sprained ankle, but what a night for Andre. Two touchdowns. One on an interception return, the other on the run back of a fumble. 42 0 Seattle. Ted Danton and Boston Legal's Julie Bowen on an all new Jimmy Kimmel Live ABC Late Night Tonight. Seattle on top by a score of 42 to nothing. Largest shutout in Monday night history. 1987. Remember it well. San Francisco beat Chicago 41 to nothing. So recall in that game, John, the 49ers had a huge lead at the half. And all you envisioned was Mike Ditka just blowing the plaster off the walls in the locker room at halftime. Yeah, sometimes it gets so bad though that you know there's nothing you can do about it. I mean, you just call in the dogs and put out the fire. The hunt's over and you go to get on to the next one. Remember that happened to me once in Kansas City. I mean we just couldn't get anything. I mean everything we did it went wrong and I said the heck with it. I just took all my guys out put other guys in and said just just finish the game. Let's get the heck out of here. Second. Ten. Leonard Weaver. Well, this hunt is over. This hunt has been over. Yeah, oh, yeah. I mean, it's, it's over in another way, too. But you know, and it has to story. be no, it has to be tough for both of these coaches. I mean, Mike Holmgren, you know, Andy Reid was not only his assistant and disciple, but he's one of his best friends. And, you know, I mean, you, you want to win, you want to beat everyone, but you don't want anyone to be embarrassed. And, and I, think, I think the Eagles have been embarrassed tonight. Mm hmm and the Giants will be coming here on Sunday. And then where, where do the Eagles begin now to regroup? I mean, for starters, John McMahon or Detmer? I think I think they have to go with Detmer. I mean, I I just think that they have to you know try and you know get a little running game going and get some play action pass and you know hope their defense can hold the Giants down and, and play that kind of game. I think that. Uh, uh, Mike McMahon is just is just too much of a wild cannon. Fourth down, Tom Ruin into punt again. The Eagles do not have another quarterback besides those two. Cowboys can't be too happy either because they need a Giants loss next week. Division leaders, Indy, of course, undefeated. Denver lost yesterday, so the Bronx and the Bengals each with nine and three records. New England on top in the AFC East. And then the wild card race has Jacksonville at nine and three. They'd be number five, Kansas City and San Diego, with one meeting between those two teams still to come, each at eight and four. And Pittsburgh in jeopardy right now. You know, other than Indy of the of, the, of that group, I think Cincinnati's the best team I've seen. Boy, Cincinnati and San Diego. That was a, a, as if they needed a validating win. They didn't, but they knocking off Pittsburgh yesterday. No, they're good. They're the real deal. Mm -hmm. So as the clock strikes midnight, Moats gets taken down by Babino. Four and a half to go before the. Seahawks can go out to the airport, get the ice, and head back to the great Northwest. One thing about Andy Reid, I was talking to his wife last night or the other night, and 
I said, how's Andy taking this? And she said, thank what? He's fine. And when he comes home, you know, nothing bothers him. I said, that's great. He is, and you described him before as as unflappable and I guess he would be as unflappable as any coach in the NFL right and if you're even keel then that means that you know that when things go bad you you, you kind of are the same guy that you are when things are going well and and that's hard to do and I know it's hard for any competitor to do and Andy Reid's a competitor and I know that I could never do it but if anyone could do it and be even keel when things are going this badly it's Andy Reid. And I think it's paid off through the years. The Mahi, the ball carrier, here to the extension. We've talked about this. I mean, they had every opportunity. They suffered, you know, those three excruciating losses. I mean, especially the Carolina loss when they they're thinking, okay, you know, we're going to win this and we're going to finally go to the Super Bowl. Before that, they had lost to to St. Louis in a championship game, and, and they were in Tampa Bay. So they they kept you know they were one step from the Super Bowl and then finally you say well you know you, you, you can't get there again but he did it last year and then he finally got that that one final step to the Super Bowl. Yeah that's what you know Bum Phillips years ago said we keep knocking the, at the door one of these days we're going to kick the darn thing in and I think that's how Andy approached it. And Ryan Moats taken down by Patrick Pruitt. Paul Allen, the uh, who made his fortune with Microsoft, with Bill Gates through the years, the chairman of the team on hand here tonight, and then his ball club is going to go back home with a record of 10 and 2. And at the moment, they would be the number one seed. The road to the Super Bowl in the NFC would go through the state of Washington. He's one of those guys that has all the money, isn't he? At, oh yeah. You, you would think they wouldn't be standing in the snow. <laughs> And that's thrown out of bounds. I mean, isn't, isn't he always on top of one of those lists? You know, those lists of oh, yeah. you know the wealthiest guys, and oh yeah, this guy, and there he is down there, and yep. standing in the snow, and must love his football. Certainly, at the moment, another guy on the uh, Forbes 400 right there. I think he is, or he's not. You know, you never know these days. Well, I, I mean, if Paul, Paul, Allen's, with Paul, Allen. you know, if Paul Allen's walking down the street, you're not going to go, oh, yeah, there's a guy in the, you know, like in the top ten. And that's intercepted here by Jimmy Williams. And I say that because he puts on no airs. I mean, you look at Paul, you know, he's got a shirt on, rarely wears a tie. You know. No, no, that's what I was saying. And, and he's letting the snow snow on him. Right. I mean that doesn't look like a ring of a no nope. guy who has all the money right. Somebody picked up on a street in New York. The one thing he has a good coach. Though. I mean you know that that Mike Holmgren. I mean it's funny when things go well you know they're good coaches or geniuses and when things don't go well you want to fire them. But Mike Holmgren has been a steady good coach in this league for a long time. Seattle can take it down to the two minute warning here. Then over the outside. And trying not to go out of bounds to keep the clock moving, but failing in that attempt was Leonard Weaver, rookie out of Carson Newman. Autotrader.com post game show will be coming up next as we wrap up. Week 13 of the NFL season. Seahawks are going to go home to face San Francisco, and right now they're just looking at getting that number one seed and having to think about playing on a wild card weekend and making sure the road to Detroit goes through Seattle. Two minute warning approaching here in Philadelphia. Where the Seahawks struck early and often and turned this into a second round knockout. 42 to nothing.
Reggie White. What a disruptive fourth. Look out. Six at the three. Reggie White. Drift of the ball. Guess who? 92. And Reggie White comes up with the loose ball and takes it all the way down to the nine-yard line. What an extraordinary football player. Reggie White gets the ball back at the five-yard line. Look at the speed of Reggie White. One of the finest players ever to play in Philadelphia. Reggie White, number retired here earlier in Green Bay and then University of Tennessee, his alma mater as well. You know, one good thing about the Hall of Fame, it's it's not like baseball that, you know, a a, a player doesn't go in the Hall of Fame, you know, with a uniform on. I mean, he doesn't go in and where, you know, Sarah was kind of talking about that. He, you really don't have to make a decision. Do you go in as a Green Bay Packer or a Philadelphia Eagle? Oh, come on, he's holding. Seven. Wallace. Throws a bouncer. Incomplete. Forty or more points in the history of the league. The Cardinals in '66, 146, and tonight at the moment, 194 yards for the Seahawks. So that would be the second fewest. Of course, when you run back, two interceptions and a fumble, and the defense does the job. That's a good part of the reason. You're right, you don't need a lot of offense, and then when you take your top running back out of the game at halftime, you don't need anymore. And the only thing left for this crowd is to avoid the shutout, and Mahi doing his best to do just that with a good run back. You know, do you think the fans that stay are really the good fans or are under another heading? I think well I think there I think there's a combination I think some of them are very good fans and others are in need of some help at a certain point well then that, that, that would fall into that category yeah but I think one thing you'll notice most of them are young I mean it's a younger <laughs> it's a younger crowd that will tend to stay at a 42 to nothing game with under two minutes to go. The older you are, the more bundled up you are. And the earlier you left. Right. The younger you are, the more liquored up you are. With a minute and 35 seconds remaining in the fourth quarter. Yeah, you never see an old guy take his shirt off, do you? <laughs> I bet you were giving somebody an idea. Though. Some <laughs> old guy? Well, we... <laughs> I'm told that guy's 95. Yeah, but he has a shirt on. He has his, yeah, he's got everything on. Show me a guy that's 95 and has his shirt off, and then we're talking. Well, we've got two more games this month in Baltimore and New York. So you think we'll see one of them then? I have a feeling. Well, the closest thing would be Barrel Man in Denver. Yes. Lewis. I remember Barrel Man. Barrel Man doesn't. No, he's not still there, is he? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He's, he's still, there? still there. I mean, the big question about Barrel Man was what he had underneath the barrel. That's right. Got Reggie Brown making the catch. And Detmer, well, he figures if nothing else, let's see if we can get some points on the board. Take a shot. Don't finish with zero. One final play. And that is just short of the goal line, and Smith drops it anyway. And that will be the end of the game. Seahawks scored in that first drive, that long 16-play drive. Defense does 
a tremendous job tonight and they win the game by a score of 42 to nothing. Monday Night Football brought to you by Fantastic Four. Own it on DVD tomorrow. Rated PG-13 by Nissan. Inviting you to shift the way you move through the world. And Campbell's Chunky Soup in microwavable bowls. Campbell's Chunky, it fills you up right. Autotrader.com postgame show coming right up from Philadelphia. Welcome to the Autotrader.com postgame show. Here now, Al Michaels. First drive of the game tonight in Philadelphia lasted 8 minutes and 10 seconds, 16 plays and 65 yards for Seattle as they methodically marched down the field. And that drive was culminated by this touchdown pass to Bobby Ingram. It made the score 7 to nothing, and Seattle never looked back. Ingram's first touchdown of the season. Then the defense went to work as McMahon threw it right into the arms of Andre Dyson. And Dyson rolled to the end zone for 72 yards. Then the rookie out of USC, Lofa Tatupa, with his pick to run it in for a touchdown. And then you had this interception here by Bullware. It was that sort of half for the Philadelphia Eagles. Meanwhile, Alexander scored two touchdowns tonight to give him 22 for the season. And then in the second half, it began this way. Moats fumbling. Dyson runs it back in for a touchdown. His second score of the night. And the final score is Seattle 42, Philadelphia nothing. Defense does the job. A couple of guys going up on the horse trailer tonight. From the D, you got Tatupu and you've got Dyson scoring three touchdowns between them, and they're both with Sam Ryan. All right, thanks a lot, Al. Andre Dyson, Lofa Tatupu, a combined 21 points between these two gentlemen. Lofa, Mike Holmgren was telling us last night, I don't know how good this defense is of mine. What did you guys have to prove tonight? You know, we just want our play to do the talking, and uh, I think we did. It was evident tonight. Uh, a great offense, a lot of weapons, and uh, we just had fun out there. Now you already locked up the division, still have first round by, and home field to play for. How important is that to this team? We still got a lot to prove, and, uh, you know, we got to reset the goals now. Now that you've attained one, you got to keep going, so uh, we're pushing for it. Thanks a lot, Lofa. Andre out in street clothes now. I know you banked up that ankle on the uh, second touchdown. What's the prognosis on it? Um, I think it's just a, a bad sprain, you know, just get rehab this week and hopefully I'll be back uh, ready to play next week. Yeah, because you do have the short re week, San Francisco. Kelly's already out, so you think you'll be all ready to go next week? Yeah, I mean, the only time will tell, you know, I'm going to work hard and the trainer's going to get me ready and uh, hopefully I'll be able to play next week. I know you got winded on the first touchdown. What were you thinking the second time? Uh, well, actually, when I got up, my I, I noticed he rolled over my ankle and it was hurting. I, would, I didn't realize really I scored. I was just like, oh, my ankle. And I, it, it didn't feel good. And, you know, they just started to carry me off. You know, I wanted to walk off. But, you know, I'm just happy that we came out here and put on a good show and, and came out the W. And you certainly did, Andre. I know they called you Miracle Baby at birth, just one pound, one pound nine ounces. And, Al, he was Andre the Giant tonight. He certainly was. Two touchdowns for him tonight. Largest margin of victory in the history of the NFL by a team with fewer than 200 yards. You just saw it. The Giants and the Redskins back in 38. That was the record, but tonight Seattle does it as they win the game by a score of 42 to nothing. Next Monday to Atlanta, where the Falcons will be hosting the New Orleans Saints on Monday Night Football. Detroit Green Bay, ESPN on Sunday night. Until next week, Al Michaels, John Madden, Sam Ryan, and our entire ABC Sports crew saying good night from Philadelphia.